Welcome to the Independent Characters, episode 91. This is Carl. And this is Jeff. And this episode we're going to be doing part two of our coverage of Horus Heresy 2 Massacre. And before we get into that, we're going to go over hobby progress, we're going to go over games played, all kinds of stuff. Jeff actually has hobby progress for his final episode, we should mention. This is Jeff's final episode as co-host of the Independent Characters, though he will come in and guest host from time to time and join us in the Warrior Lodge to give us his opinion on all the things that I like and he hates. Not that I'm opinionated (laughs) or anything, but... Uh, Before we move into that, though, we do have a huge announcement. We have a couple, actually, fairly large announcements right now. First one is, as you know, or you should know by now, the 2013 Hobby Progress Challenge is over and we would like to announce the winners. I didn't get a chance to do my Grey Knight army. Yeah, my uh, Thousand Suns are done. Oh, are they? <laughs> done looking at me on the shelf over there. You, you no, re them? <laughs> over there, like oh. down on the lower shelf oh. on a tray. <laughs> oh, you did move them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so a couple stats real quick. There were 265 people that started the Hobby Progress Challenge. Okay. Now, mind you, this includes some people that were like, I'm going to post my list. Yeah. Nothing but crickets sure, after sure, that. Yeah. 57 people actually completed the challenge and have fully painted armies That's a at lot this of point. people. That is a lot of people for the war on bare plastic. Yes. Uh, and, and and I have to say... <laughs> it I, is the season. <laughs> I have received a lot of email from people saying things like, I've never had a fully painted army before, mm-hmm. and now I do for the first time ever. And so for some reason, this seemed to strike a nerve with some people and got them kind of moving and... And I'm glad that it helped, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we have planned for next year, but that'll wait till next episode. But we, we've almost got all the details locked down there. So 57 people fully completed. There were 706 monthly completions, meaning that a person made a commitment and then completed that 706 commitment. 706 months? Yeah. Man months? Yeah. Man hours? Or, or women man months, because there were some women that took place. Lady months as well? As well. No. Moving on. <laughs> so this is pretty amazing. I'm I'm really excited that it's it's worked so well for people and uh yeah. So should we announce the winners? No. All right, let's move on. Skip then. it. All right. Maybe we should announce them later. No, we'll go ahead and announce them now. Okay. okay. All right. So as you know, there are two drawings that take place. Mm-hmm. Uh the first is for people that have totally completed the challenge with mm-hmm. the completed army. The other one is everybody who has ever completed a monthly challenge and got something in. Uh, So the first one is for people who have completed the challenge, even Mm -hmm. if they didn't complete all commitment months. So maybe they painted their whole army in six months. Okay. Great. If they actually did that early, they get full completion. But Mm -hmm. let's say they missed a month here or there, but ultimately they completed painting the army. Uh, So as we just determined, this is out of 57 people. Right. (laughs) The winner of... The Kaiser 3 case, full of foam, Mm -hmm. is Pablo the Great and his Crimson Fist army. Nice. Which I got to tell you, is really nice looking. Like, he did a really good job. Very, you know, congratulations, man. Uh, This is great looking stuff. You now have a Kaiser 3 that we are going to ship out to you. And uh, so please send me an email to carl at theindependentcharacters.com. And uh, with your contact information, address, and I will get this sent out to you uh, once I confirm your email address to the one that you have registered on our forum. Second winner. So this is for a Kaiser II full of foam. Uh, we will ship this out to you. The winner is Tangentical for the Cabal of the Burnished Sapphire. Yeah, Dark Eldar. Dark Eldar. And his stuff looks <laughs> pretty darn good, too. Yeah. I mean, this is really nice-looking set. Of, of things as I as I scroll through this. Funny thing is, uh, I actually played against him huh. when I was in London. Did I tell you I went to London? Did you go to London? He uh, plays at the Overlords Club, and I, I did not know that when I drew it, but as I started uh, looking at it, I realized, oh, this is the guy with the really nice Dark Eldar that I played at, at the Overlords Club. And let me tell you, the pictures here do not do his stuff justice. It is really, really beautiful stuff. So those are the two winners of our Hobby Progress Challenge. We're hoping to actually, 
Well, we'll talk about more next episode, but we're hoping <laughs> to offer even more than just two potential winners next year. So uh, we're going to have some very special things. So if you're about to paint an army and about to get started, stop, stop what you are doing. <laughs> Josh, do not, proceed, do not proceed any further. Please wait until the end of this month. We will announce it. I'm going to have a guest host for one more episode this month, which will cap out our year. And uh, during that episode, we will talk about all the details as well as we will post all the details online again. Mm -hmm. And then we'll kick it off for something special in 2014. So if you're, if you're, uh, if you miss this one, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, I got ideas for, for the next time. We are going to do something special next time. And uh, we think you're going to be excited about it. Jeff, what else do we have to announce? I think we need to announce something. This one's for the local crew. Yeah. Locals only. <laughs> Unless you want to fly in. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or drive real far. Yeah. I, I don't know that. A train, a boat. That's really what. <laughs> <laughs> this may not be the time to do that, but uh, it's time for a deep strike event. Yeah, it is. So we're going to do it post-holiday this time, Saturday, January 25th. And we're going back to Harry's Hofbrau. Yeah, this is a really cool restaurant to hang out in. Uh, we probably going to do a white elephant thing. We're, mm-hmm. we're going to put all the details up on the website. Yep. And I'll link to them uh, from our Facebook page as well. Yep, we're looking at starting around 7 p.m. Yep. At the Hofbrau. It's on a Saturday this time. We've done it on a, like a Friday night in yeah. the past. And people have had trouble coming down from... Traffic is bad. Traffic, that kind of yeah. Thing. It's the holiday, so they didn't have the weekend open. So we pushed it a little bit farther back than, than we have previously. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Jeff, you're going to attend, right? Oh, yeah. I set the whole thing up. I'm just yeah, saying. The one that's like, oh, well, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> you set up this show, too, but then you abandon it. Oh, <laughs> you know, oh, oh, snap. <laughs> oh zing. Zing. There he is. Uh, but, but no, seriously, you're going to be there. I'm going to be there. Probably several of the people who you have heard as uh, guest hosts on the show will be there. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's always a great time. We hang out. We have some beers. We eat some food. We talk 40K and other games, and mm-hmm. we're going to do white elephant right, thing, right. even though it's post-holiday. Yeah, we uh, should, should, should note that these are, it's not a get-together to play the game. Nope. It's just a hangout, a meet-and-greet kind of thing. And we typically encourage that people don't bring their significant other, because it's just going to be a bunch of guys and girls standing around talking about 40K. Unless their significant other plays and is involved in the hobby, right. they, might, they might wind up kind of bored. Right, right. Which is going to mean a problem for yeah. you. So, so no you've got, you've got like a month and a half. Yep. To set aside, you know, the the calendar space for this. Mark it on your calendar now. Your collective calendar, if that's what you need to do. Set this time aside for yourself. And we'll continue to remind you as and it draws we, closer. Yes. Carl uh, will remind you as it draws closer. Also, there's going to be drinking involved, that kind of thing. Yes, so there will. They kid, have a fantastic bar. Kids may want to. You you're going to want to keep your kids home for for this event. So. Uh, we're not held responsible. <laughs> Nerds gone wild. <laughs> That's right. Oh God, no! With the with the the metal drum music. In yeah. The back. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the steel drum. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, anything else that we have to add other than that? I don't think so, man. I think we should kick this thing off. All right. Well, let's do that. And uh, I'm sorry to see you go, but at least you're here for a couple more hours. Yeah. All right. Let's get started. The following segment is brought to you by Secret Weapon Miniatures. With their weathering powders, washes, and brass etch, Secret Weapon Miniatures is your one-stop shop for making your models look like they just came off the battlefield. You can even use your coupon code ICPODCAST at secretweaponminiatures.com for an additional 10% off your order. Wargamma.com, where you can get resin terrain, craters, lakes, lava pools, and objectives. Figure bases for all types of models. Character models including Battle Wolf War Mounts and Spawn Seeds, Linked Barricades. Choose from one of six designs to suit the origins of your army from Star Pharaoh, Spawn Hive, Mechanoid, Dark Ancients, Dredelian Noble, and Chromag Scrapyard. Linked Barricade sets include 12 large shields, which are 2 inches wide and 4 connecting walls, cover nearly a 30 inch line. Sets also include a matching multi gun turret. Wargamma.com. Alternative Battle Miniatures. Final hobby progress, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got? We, you actually have something, though. A little bit. A little bit. Not, not a ton. So I've been playing with the technical paint 
the, right. I now I can't remember what it is. Whatever the cracked earth, earth or, or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. And so the first one that I did, I took lots of pictures, so I can post these up on the Facebook page. These are the GW technical paints that we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. So the first one I did was just a regular, I, I wouldn't even call it a thin layer. I would mm-hmm. just call it a, a normal layer over like a blue-white scheme that I did. Okay. And it cracked pretty well, but it's very small little pieces. So essentially what I think I did was what I would do for actually using it as cracked earth as opposed to something cracking and then there's mystical energy or lava or anything below it. Just if I was doing like a a desert kind of badlands scheme. Gotcha. The next one that I did, I went on thick, very, very thick. And this one was over kind of a red, yellow, orange lava type scheme. And it came out pretty well. I mean, I'm pretty happy with the results. Nice big chunks, that kind of stuff. A little too big, I think, for my taste. Okay. So I went back, and then I did another one, of course, somewhere in between, and it came out, I think, perfect for what I was going yeah. for, for the for the lava effect. Here's the problem. So I, I knew that it would, quote-unquote, work. Like, people We'd have seen done it people. before. Yeah. yeah. I know that it would work. What I was trying to find out is how much effort is it going to be for me to do this? Is it worth it for me to go back and rebase my salamander army this way? So far, I think the answer is no, and here's why. It's very easy to put the technical paint on once you do, like I said, I got it right on the third try, so no problem there. The problem is now I have to go back and get it black somehow, so that's either going to be mixing something to make it black before it dries, so I'm essentially turning this brown paint black, which is very, very difficult, so I mess around with that a little bit by adding some wash and that kind of stuff, Yeah. yeah. It didn't do what I wanted it to. I think it would take so much of the other color to get it right mm-hmm. that it would ruin the crackle effect. Screws up the property of the of yeah. the paint. Yeah. yeah. So then you have to paint it on afterwards, right? Mm-hmm. And so you've got tons of little tiny rocks, you know, ra- little raised parts on there that you have to paint black. And I just think for all the effort that I've done to paint the bottom of the base ahead of time to look like lava. Mm-hmm to paint on the technical paint, and then to go back and paint the technical paint black, I probably should have just bought resin bases okay. right? and painted the lava on. Because i got to paint the lava on those anyway. i got to paint the black theoretically, but if I prime it black, then it's already, I just need to dry brush it gray. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I feel like at this point, with it being brown and having to change it black, it's not going to work. Right. So I did a little bit of research, and by a little bit, I mean I went to a couple hobby stores in the area, <laughs> Went to Michael's. There is some crackle paint out there. Mm-hmm. It is definitely cheaper than the GW well, version, sure, sure. right? But you're going to have to paint it still. Martha Stewart, as a matter of fact, is the one that I found at Michael's. And it was like 6 bucks or something for a pretty significant chunk of crackle paint. I don't know how well it crackles is the problem. Okay. It may, the cracks may be just way too big right. for, what, for our purposes. I have seen with the GW stuff that you can kind of change that based on the thickness of the layer that you put on, and I would assume that it's the same for other hobby crackle paint. Now, the other one that I found was at, actually, Joanne Fabrics, Mm -hmm. and that was already black. Right. It was 8 bucks, and so the problem was I didn't want to pull the trigger on it. If it doesn't work, I'm out 8 bucks, and I have a lifetime supply of black crackle paint that I can't do anything with. If it does work, though. If it does work. And it works on a a large scale like that, it might be interesting to use it on a game table. It, yeah, that actually could be a really could interesting... underpaint like piece. a lava thing mm-hmm. and then just put that on. I wonder if it works that well. It would take a lot, I think, to do a game table. I mean, we're talking about the amount of paint that you have, those little 8-ounce mm-hmm. containers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You think one of those would cover an entire game table? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, 8 bucks, cool game table. There you go. I don't know if that... Like, you're talking that size for the crackle paint? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it might take more than that, especially yeah. if you need to get it that thick, right? right. I, I, That's what I mean. Yeah, who so, knows? So... But an interesting idea. I mean, I think there's a lot of potential for this. And I think for really creative people that are willing to put the work in, we're going to see some really awesome stuff Mm -hmm. coming out of this. Mm -hmm. That's what I took away from it. So for me, it's not really there yet. Right. But ultimately, if they release a black, uh, I'm sold. I'm on board. I'll pay $4 a pot for it. The guys from Sprue Hammer sent us the sampling of of the technical paints from GW that we've been playing with. Mm -hmm. And so far... I have to say, like, the typhus corrosion I'm pretty happy with. I Mm -hmm. really like the results I've gotten from that Mm -hmm. uh, for what I've used it for. 
The blood from the blood gods getting good reviews. Yep. Uh, I the orange again. I'm on the fence about the orange. Right. right. Uh, and those are the only two I've tried out so far. But but I mean, I'm I'm pretty pleased. It's it's kind of cool. It's it's cool to see them release something like that. Mm-hmm. So they have very specific uses. But that's the thing I like about this one is that it seems like it's people are experimenting with those uses right. and and getting different results. Out. Right. Yeah. And that's what I'm looking forward to seeing how people can use this. I think. There's been a few people that have actually done it on models, mm-hmm. done this sort of effect, this cracked earth, you know, like a earth golem type effect right. and that kind of stuff. The avatar looks the similar. The avatar, yeah, right. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of uses for it, but you, I think it's not the quick and easy solution that I was looking for, right. but it will do, and it is a very a very interesting and, and compelling effect, I think. I'll, cool. I'll get some pictures up. People can see, kind of make their, their minds up for themselves. The other thing that I was doing is I was playing around with Taking a casting of uh, like scale, uh-huh. basically off of a, um, a a model, and then doing green stuff, press molds. And by scale, you it. mean like dragon, dragon type scales. scales. Yep. In your case, salamander. So, yeah, scales. exactly. So right. dragon scales, and, and just doing a green stuff press mold. And mm-hmm. I've been really happy with the results on that. Yeah, the cloak you out, have there looks really awesome. Yeah, it worked out better actually than I could have possibly imagined. So I'm really looking forward to using that. Uh, in the future to to see what I can come up with right. in terms of doing just different accent pieces for my salamanders, maybe kind of drape it over the shoulder pad, Forge World style, or... Oh, yeah, that would look cool. Yeah, we were talking last time about the one salamander space marine in the Mark III armor where he yes. uses it as like a face cowl kind yeah. of thing. Yep. Um, so that that ought to be really neat. I think just sticking... Like, it'd, it'd make a Terminator unit really stand out, too, if you just gave them all cloaks. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's yep. what the fire drakes are. It's Terminators with these drake scale cloaks on. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. so to be able to do that is, is pretty exciting for me. That's kind of it. I mean, it, it is one evening of hobbying and playing around with stuff. But it's fun to... Is to, it somebody to, painting your stuff? N- not <laughs> right now. Oh, okay. I don't think I have anything <laughs> I out right now. I thought that right was now. your... No, it, assembly, actually. Quarter. So I haven't made it up to Frontline yet to drop off my okay. Wraith Knight. Okay. So maybe... Maybe drop that off on Wednesday or something. They're too busy making videos about D weapons. That's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> I have done. You've been busy, right? I, well, I've done very little in the hobby progress front. Actually, I have worked on the Titan just a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to do the interior of the Titan now. I haven't really got very far on it, so I, I wouldn't even claim that as progress at this point. It's just too little uh, for me to really Except say. Except for the gun, then are you done with the exterior of the Titan, or are you going to fiddle with it some more? I'm probably going to fiddle here or there. There's so many details on it that you mm-hmm. can't... I, I could call it done right now, yeah. but there's a lot of detail on it that I could say, oh, you know, I want to touch up this little thing or maybe mm-hmm. add to these uh, little bolts that are in there or whatever. Right. But I think I could like, I could put it on a table and say, it's done. Okay. Uh, and, and it looks done, and I'm pleased with it. Uh, so overall, like, the Titan's coming along good. I'm excited mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. And again, my my list on my Kanban board for Adepticon is significantly shorter than other stuff, so I just need to knock that out. What really kind of did me in, I thought I was going to have more hobby time, but we had uh, my friend Ryan come mm-hmm. up from Southern California right, and stay with us for a few days, he and his family, and so we did a lot of family stuff, but Ryan and I also got in some games, mm-hmm. uh, and then Aaron came over and I got in a game. I had to actually cancel a game I was going to play with Crimson Fist Ian, mm-hmm. but I had to cancel that game due to family stuff uh, yesterday, so... Right. Um, I've gotten a lot of games in, but that has taken the place of me doing hobby, which is not not too bad of a, of yeah, a swap. Right, right. So on the gameplay front, have you have you played anything no, recently? I haven't played anything. Okay, you've been starting to ramp up. Well, you're still on vacation right now, but you're starting to ramp up towards your busy yeah. work period. Yeah, I think it's just going to be prep for Adepticon, taking some different things to the friendly than I took last time. Got it. So okay. Well, I have uh, for for playing. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I played a game against Ryan, mm-hmm. and here's the thing. So Ryan has a large orc army, a Tyranid army, an Eldar army. I think that's it. Okay. I think I'm missing something there. But he I'm hasn't not. been playing that long. But he doesn't play of... very often is oh, okay. the thing. He works, like you think we work long hours, he works 100-hour mm-hmm. weeks mm-hmm. easily. Like he, he, It's crazy how little his family sees him. Uh, and he, he develops games for Sony Online. He, he's working on uh, Planet Side 2 and all this. So he works a lot. And so when he does get a chance to play, he really wants to play. So he came over, brought his Eldar up. I said, hey, bring whatever you want, you know, uh, Wave Serpent, Spam, whatever you want. Yeah. So he shows up and he says, 
Well, I only brought six wave surfers. Oh, okay. Only <laughs> so six? Is, is that all? Only six? Well, some guys I know are fielding like eight or nine of them. And I said, yeah, you know what we call those guys? <laughs> <laughs> Douchebags. <laughs> right. But I was like, you know what? Fine. I don't care. Bring bring whatever you want. So he ended up with a list that had essentially six wave serpents, two fire prisms, and the what's the uh, night spinner? Mm-hmm. And I think that was it. Oh, there was like a oh jet bikes, a bunch of jet bikes with a farseer on a jet bike as well. Okay. And so I thought, well, this is going to be a really short game. And I just had this kind of may list. It right. was consisted of. Uh, a land raider with five terminators in it. I had Tigerius. I had two squads of tac marines. I had a drop pod with ten starting guard in it that had two combi meltas and mm-hmm. uh, two melta guns. And I had a razorback with a heavy bolter. Okay. And one storm talon. And I think that was the entirety of my list. And <laughs> so the game starts out with me going first. I drop in. No, I'm I'm sorry. I went second. Mm-hmm. Uh, he really didn't have much to to get a line on in the first round. It was night fighting that first round as well. Okay. Didn't have much to, to get a line on. I think he shot up a couple units but didn't really kill a couple guys here or there. He didn't really focus on one unit at a time. Mm-hmm. So as he had moved around, when my deep striking stern guard come in, that was the other unit I had was Legion of the Damned. Okay. Uh, the stern guard come in first turn. And I'm able to blow up one of his vehicles because it had used its wave serpent shield shooting mm-hmm. at my stuff. Sure. So I take it out. Uh, the stern guard split into two five man tactical or five man uh, combat squads, mm-hmm. and you know I'm able to spread around some of the melta love. Uh, so now he has to. He's feeling like he has to deal with those guys. I run the land raider right up the middle of the table. Yeah. And the uh, the rest of the army kind of just hunkers back near Tigerius in a in a kind of castled up area near one of my objectives. I run. <laughs> I start to run the Razorback with five guys in it towards a near nearby objective as well. Mm-hmm. Just nah, I'm going to cruise over there. In the next round, they kind of make it to that objective, but sit there in the vehicle for a while. There's no reason for them to get out. They're out of line no. of sight. Yeah. Just yeah. hang out here. The Razorback kind of sits there behind a building. Like it can be. It can't really be seen by. He could zip over there if he wanted to. But second round, because I have Tigerius, he allows me to re-roll my reserve checks, mm-hmm. and I'm able to bring in. The the uh, Legion of the Damned, my flyer comes in, you know, so now my whole army's on the table, thankfully. And it, it's a really close game, and it shouldn't have been. Like, mm-hmm. Ryan, it had he used his mobility, once my Legion of the Damned came in near the Stern Guard, all of a sudden he felt like, I have to deal with these Terminators that are now out of right. the thing. Mm-hmm. I have to deal with this, these Legion of the Damned, and I have to deal with the Stern Guard. And I'm thinking, well, I hope he just stays over there and ignores my troops way back here, right. which is what he did. And had he just used his incredible mobility to zip over to the other side of the table, ignore all your heavy hitters, shoot on my troops, game mm-hmm. would have been over. Right. But, and those guys would have slowly tried to walk, but he got so concentrated on destroying the Land Raider mm-hmm. and destroying, the, and it took him forever to destroy the Land Raider. Yeah, it, that's not the army to destroy a Land they Raider. They got Lance thing. weapons, but it just wasn't yeah. happening. It just wasn't. He didn't have that many, right. and I had destroyed one of the fire prisms and then assaulted the other fire prism yeah. with the terminator a razorback should have been no sweat that should have been pretty high up on the kill list again only heavy bolter on it right it's not really it's but kind the five of guys threat, inside right kind of threat but not really yeah five, five guys inside now kind of sitting over near a scoring unit you just dedicate two wave serpents to killing zip that. over there kill it and yeah. you're done so but so what ends up happening is i'm winning in the fifth round mm-hmm. i'm winning in the sixth round but now I'm, I'm now like my stuff has started to die. Right. The attrition is setting in, and I'm starting to lose. Now he's like, "Oh, I should kill these troops over here." And he starts shooting at them, and I'm like, "Okay, I'm starting to lose these guys. It's starting to be a come up problem." Seventh round rolls around, and uh, I had missile launchers on the tactical squads. Mm-hmm. Finally, he's able to kill both missile launchers. Now I'm like, "Well, I have nothing that can hurt his tanks at this point." The game had flip flopped to now he's sitting on two of the objectives. Three of the objectives out of five. I'm on two. I have first blood. I have slay the warlord. Mm-hmm. He does not. Uh, and I also have line breaker. Oh. And so that's a tie then. At this point, it's it's a tie. Oh no, I'm sorry. I did not have line breaker. Mm-hmm. But what I do is I drive my because he he took out the things that had line breaker. I drive my rhino, my razor back forward. Finally, mm-hmm. it's just been sitting there the whole game. It turns its its heavy bolter on a squad of dire avengers sitting on a. On an objective, objective. Mm-hmm. I kill two of them. 
They break. And they break off the objective. Yep. Bottom of round seven. Like yep. that was – that. it came down to a leadership test right. <laughs> at that point. Yep. But the reality is I should have lost the game, and I should have lost it a whole lot earlier than I did. You know, it's just the fact that Ryan doesn't play very often, and he could have way outmaneuvered me. He could have won this game just based in, in the maneuver phase sure. and, and just didn't take advantage of that. So then we decided – uh, hey, why don't we play some Zone Mortalis? Yeah. So we got two Zone Mortalis games in. Mm. Uh, I won the first Zone Mortalis game. It was one of those cases where I sat behind a big closed door, waited for his guys to get there, opened the closed door, gunned the guys down, assaulted, right. and, and then kind of won the game at that point. Uh, the second game we played, he ended up taking me to task. Uh, he was running like the Avatar in there, and mm-hmm. oh, he had a... Uh, a Wraith Lord in there as right, well. Right. And they're they're tough to deal with in oh, close yeah? combat. Oh, yeah? Are they tough to deal <laughs> yeah. with in close combat? Yeah. But they don't kill anything. Is they it? Once don't. they're in close combat, they'll keep you there for a long Forever, time. But they don't kill anything. Yeah. yeah. I, so. It's like a dreadnought. But I find with Zone Mortalis, the, the hard part with Eldar in there is not speed, right? Because they can zip around. Mm-hmm. It's not killing things because they've all got their little Bladestorm yep. pseudo rending, yep. right? It's opening doors. <laughs> it's really hard for Eldar to open doors. Well, we made the doors controllable. So right. like anybody could oh, open anybody and close the door. Okay. Right? And uh, that, that made it that made for a very interesting game, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes he decided to close the door behind him, or I decided to close the door behind me. Yeah. But for the most part, once you open it, you open it, and that, right. that's that. Well, then you waste a turn, though, either opening or closing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, as long as you're touching it at the right. end of your movement phase, you can open it. So. Okay. I mean, yeah, but then you have to stop at the door is what I'm yes. saying, right? Yeah. So you have to time it right because if I open it, that means it's open for you to come through. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. So, it, Which is interesting because he was saying, oh, it, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I have these guys all standing at a door mm-hmm. waiting for you to open it. You would think you open it and I could shoot you, right. <laughs> you know? Right. And I was like, yeah, well, I mean, in, if this were a simulation game, yeah, that would be a problem, but right. it's really not. Right. So. But it was fun, and I think he had a lot of fun being introduced to Zone Mortalis. Because we were able to play those games very quickly. And, and you know, it was on 4x4, four four and it was a lot of fun. Did you get anything fun on the catastrophic damage? or No. And, in fact, we forgot to roll it both times. And okay. that was the funny part, because after the first game, I was like, oh, we forgot to roll on this table. You still forgot. And then we played a second game, and we totally forgot to roll on it again. And I think mm-hmm. that's fine, because we were caught up in what we were doing, and, and we were having a great time. So sometimes it doesn't really matter. But uh, the, it was fun. The Zone Mortalis rules are pretty... <clears throat> I mean, there's not a lot to them. No. A lot of it has to do with force building and that kind of stuff. Yeah. It could really use, I think, a double-sided quick reference sheet. Agreed. With the, I mean, having the catastrophic damage table on at least part of that would be really helpful. Yeah, I agree. Maybe some of the movement restrictions for like, oh, well, bikes are affected this some way. Some quick notes on some of the yeah, weapons. Yeah, yeah, some of the, the weapons, right, That yeah. and the way that the grenades bounce around or whatever, yeah. you know, explode yeah. off the wall, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, once you get it, and I assume, you know, if you play it a whole bunch, it, it's it's second nature. On, sure. on this case, I hadn't played in a while, so I had to go back and look up a few things. But On on your, your game days and stuff where we play several Zone Mortalis okay. games mm-hmm. or someone else, you watch someone play it you, you learn okay i rolled an eight i know what that is on the right. catastrophic damage table because they tend to happen pretty frequently right 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 so. exactly and then aaron came over yesterday sunday saturday <laughs> saturday came over saturday and we played uh we played a 1850 game mm-hmm. here aaron and i have been playing a little planetary empires campaign that right it's really that's really irrelevant it's just Tracking you, our, our play. You're yeah. using the, the tiles and everything? <laughs> yeah, we, we made some new rules for them. We, okay. didn't, like All right. yeah. we didn't want rules where it was uh, size of your army shifting because mm-hmm. a lot of times it's what would pain. happen is you would forget about it and it's annoying. Mm-hmm. So usually we just like, oh, well, you know, if you have this thing, all your guys get a six up in vault mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever mm-hmm. the case may be. I don't remember what they all are. Sure. But uh, it's working pretty well. I mean, it's streamlined and it's just simple. It mostly what well, we're just, we just want to play games. So. Right. Uh, he came over and he had his standard. Well, I'm calling it a standard now because he's kind of adopted it. The two two wraith uh, units mm-hmm. with destroyer lords attached with mind shackle scarabs. Uh, he had two ghost arcs full of warriors. He had one warrior squad sitting there that that didn't have uh, a ghost arc. And I'm trying to think of what else he had in that list, but that may be it. And I ran the exact same list I just described in. 
uh, the game against Ryan because mm-hmm. I was like, hey, you know, I don't want to put out a new list. So uh, I played that list. We played an Altar of War mission, a Space Marines 2 Altar of War mission, uh-huh. which uh, was pretty fun. And this one was called the Epitome of Honor. And basically you have the Space Marine player has to pick one unit and there's this criteria of unit. It goes down. It ended up for me being Tigarius, who is the Epitome of Honor. And okay. he is... Worth more points if you kill him, but oh, okay. he adds a few minor benefits to the ar- the unit he's with or or units nearby, mm-hmm. which I forgot to use in its oh. entirety. Mostly, I was just trying to keep him from getting killed because I didn't want to give up. Like I think he became so he became slay the warlord, and he became worth three additional points. So he was worth four points if you killed him. Mm. Uh, so I was trying to really keep him out of harm's way for the most part. Keep him away from mind shackle scarabs. <clears throat> yeah. Before so, he force weapons himself or something. But here's the thing. <laughs> he's such an amazing psyker. Mm-hmm. Oh, the other thing Aaron had was two doom scythes. Okay. Uh, and I had the one flyer. So uh, Tigerius is such an amazing mm-hmm. psyker. And I, I really think I've played against you and against Justin enough to see how uh, the Eldar manipulate that, those psyker abilities mm-hmm. uh, that I just do the same thing with him. And so what would occur is first round, you know, my uh, I'm, I'm going first this game. It's an objective-based game. There's three objectives on the table, plus my guy is worth right. four victory points. Aaron races forward with his Necrons, but but my with, with the Wraiths, which is what he should do. But my first round, my drop pod comes in. I detonate one of the ghost arcs, so I get first blood. Hmm. This is always the thing I go for initially against Aaron. I hate those ghost arcs. If they're anywhere yeah. near... Those Necrons, they just keep hit bringing them back. Or something? Melta guns from the okay. Stern Guard. So they dropped in behind it. Mm-hmm. They're able to hit it, you know, on on its armor of ten, right, and destroy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other half of that squad shoots at some some of the uh, uh, warriors that are sitting on an objective. Nothing really effective there. As he begins to advance the wraiths with the lords, I know I don't want to get into close combat with those guys. Mm-hmm. I have. Terminators that could hold him up for a while probably kill a few, but they're not as great as they are usually against him because I don't have right. a chaplain with them, blah, blah, blah. Right. Long and short of it is I concentrate fire on entirely one unit of race and a lord at a time, using Tigerius to boost, you know, to make him reroll fail, uh, his successful saves, mm-hmm. to allow me to twin link guys, to give one of my squads a four up invuln. That and, is Eldar shenanigans. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> exactly what I was doing. And that, in combination with the fact that I can use my Space Marine Doctrines, so my Ultramarine mm-hmm. Doctrines, at one point I'm twin-linking all of my tactical squads. Mm-hmm. Other units, like my Stern Guard, are re-rolling ones to, to their misses. You know, uh, It just worked, again, beautifully, as I just you know, take down one squad at a time mm-hmm. and then just shift the guys over and take down another squad at a time. Aaron failed a couple key charges. Like he tried to make like an eight inch charge at one point, which you know you can't call that key because it's kind of at at the distance that he's going. Yeah, it's fairly reasonable, but he he missed that one, mm-hmm. and then he missed a charge that was like a six inch charge. Oof. Where there was a point where I too had like a six inch charge, and I rolled a six exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so ultimately, I mean, my rolls were really good. There was a point where his doom scythe came over and dropped its death ray, and I had I had made a mistake, and I had. All of these tax squads like just lined up. Yeah. Like it was a perfect thing for a death ray to just go through and just nail them all. Yeah. The problem was for him, I had used Tigerius to put a four plus invuln on mm-hmm. the tax squad that he hit first <laughs> as Uh-oh. it goes through the thing. Right. And so I mean it caused wounds to two different tax squads. One, it killed one guy and there was nothing I could do about it, but the other tax squad takes like five wounds mm-hmm. and I make all five four nice. up saves. Nice. <laughs> it was just so frustrating that Aaron. Uh, Aaron ended up having to leave at the bottom of round four, but by that point, all he had left was a 10-man warrior squad in a ghost arc and one night scythe left on the table. Oh, okay. And I had lost very little at that point. So I was doing quite well that game. Yeah. Exactly. And Tigurius, that guy's just, he's awesome. I mean, you know, because you play Eldar. Yeah. <laughs> having access to everything makes him just an amazing character. The only thing he's lacking is invuln save, so. Right. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah. He doesn't have one at all? He doesn't have one. But he can cast a four up. He can give himself a four up with right. his unit if he needs to. So 
That's pretty. It, assuming he has that here. that uh, that power, which right. is pretty freaking likely, since you get to re-roll your powers if you want them. Right. You know, it, he's 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 awesome. I mean, he's the MVP of that game. Mm-hmm. There are cases where I have him just in the wrong place, like. I've put him against Justin. He, I was so afraid of getting him shot off the table. I had him in the backfield, and he could boost the guys near him. Right, but the battle wasn't happening near him, mm-hmm. and so that was a waste. Have you used your Thunderfire Cannon at all yet? Uh, once or twice, yeah, yeah. What do you think about that? Oh, it's good. It? Yeah, yeah, it's really good. I just didn't happen to have it in this okay. list. Mm-hmm. Um, How did your flyer do against Ryan, though? I was curious because he didn't have any flyers. Did he shoot it down with? He did not have any flyers. He ended up destroying it with one of the wave serpents. Did Uh, it do some good damage? It did some damage before he took it out. I think Mm -hmm. it took out at least one vehicle, maybe a second vehicle, before Mm -hmm. he he was able to... Before he realized, oh, this is a big threat I need to deal with. Honestly, I thought the flyer was going to get taken out by Aaron in his game because he had two flyers. Mine came in first. He had one of his come in one round. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, you should... Yeah, I didn't tell him. You should probably take out my flyer. But he, he... ignored it and uh-huh. went and gunned, gunned down Terminators of all things. And right. I'm like, really? And so I start making saves. I'm okay, well, this is a five-up save. Oh, that lightning claw dies. Oh, and that was a three-up save. And he's like, why? And I'm all, Storm Shields. He's like, oh, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, right. dude, this is like basic yeah. Terminator. <laughs> you know, Terminator 101. All right, all my Terminators are fine. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, it, it, but had he, had he gone after the... The flyer that would have eliminated that as a problem right from the get go. That flyer ended up causing quite a bit of damage. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it took out one of his night scythes. It took out a squad of of warriors. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's his. He needs to keep those warriors right. alive. Right. Um, the missiles weren't doing much. You run them with the assault cannons on front. Assault cannon on front and the uh, typhoon missile launchers. Okay. Because they're strength eight. There's the strength seven. They get three shots. Right. And they have like super long range, something like sixty inches. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, if you can't hit something in this thing that moves twenty four to thirty six, right. you know, I mean, it, it, I think that is wasted unless you're playing like an apocalypse game, mm-hmm. in, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Although that third shot is kind of nice. I also had flak missiles, okay, which I didn't mention, and for some reason, just never occurred to me. The flak missiles are strength seven, not strength, right. uh, not strength eight, right? But uh, I was able to hit a couple of his flyers with flak missiles. One time he was able to dodge and, you know, like we rolled out the damage and it was like, oh, you have locked velocity in this. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I said, oh, you forgot. Do you want to try to right. evade? And he right. says, oh, yeah. I, you know, technically he's supposed to decide before, yes. but yes. it's fine. You know, right. I don't know. Right. So he rolls and he, of course he evades after I roll all this great result. But right. whatever. I mean, the game was was a lot of fun. Again, playing with Aaron's usually fun, so yep. um, I, I felt really confident about taking out the race squads with Tigerius. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Just wor- I that's got to make you feel good about yourself. You know, the three up invuln is really nice, but you just keep shooting bolters at them. They're only toughness four, right? So just bolter fire ends up right. You, uh, the weight of bolter fire yeah, ends it's up just like killing marines. Down. Yep. I mean, it takes a long time, but it's definitely doable. You have yeah. Any thoughts around the as you were talking about your land raider? Made me think about the um, Crusader pattern Land Raider. Yeah. You, you, uh, I love it. Yeah? I think the Crusader is the way to go now, to be honest with you. Uh, simply because <laughs> it puts out a lot of firepower. Mm-hmm. The b- Again, bolters. I mean, I was just firing twin link bolters at his, at his race squads and just whittling them down because it's so much fire. The assault cannon on top of that then yep. just throws more fire in mm-hmm. there. And it, yeah, they're... And now I'm talking specifically race, right? Yes, they have a three-up info, and so the rending on the assault cannon doesn't matter, but it's wounding on two, so it's just the yeah. more wounds you can stack on something like that, right. it's just going to die. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I'd take you know, the occasional multi-melta shot, which I'm almost at the point where I'm going to retire melta from my list because they almost never hit. Yeah, you... I have the terrible. worst luck with yep. melta, and quite frankly, the reason my melta guns worked was because I popped that doctrine no oh, the and then re-roll. i got to re-roll ones at least so i'm only I, failing on the twos i can't even count the number of times i've seen you roll ones oh, shooting a melta shot it's when i played doug from table war yeah he, he just kept laughing he's yeah. and he I, I think i heard him talking to blake on life after the cover save and he was basically saying yeah i don't know what carl's problem with melta is i, <laughs> I don't yeah. know either I don't, it's it's a long-standing thing with you it goes back especially to, to your my death, death guard. guard yeah that's where it started mm-hmm. those guys cannot shoot a melta gun and that's why I doubled up melta guns on them because I'm like, yeah. well, one's not gonna do it, you know. Well, two's not gonna do it either. No, so. no. 
It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uncanny. Yeah. Uh, but that's it. I mean, I, I did get a lot of games, and I've had a lot of fun. And Aaron and I got to play on the table that I mm-hmm. had the Crash Thunderhawk on. Right. And that's right. the first time I've gotten to play with it. Aaron actually took the tea light smoke things that we have and put them on it. Yeah. So it was, it was like blinking and flaming through the whole game. It was nice. pretty cool. Nice. It's a great tile. It's a great tile. And I got to say the other Forge World tile, like Imperial Defense Point tile, mm-hmm. I love that tile. It's just, it looks good and it's playable right. on. Right. Which right. is so key. Uh, this one, the one with the Thunderhawk, is playable on. Sometimes guys have a little bit of trouble standing on some of the hills where the mm-hmm. the Thunderhawks crashed into the dirt. But, I mean, they can stand on the Thunderhawk itself pretty well. We called it Dangerous Terrain sure. simply because, you know, we figured out it's, it's, yeah, it's crashed yeah. and... We called the area around it just difficult terrain. and mm-hmm. um, But it, it was playable. It was fun. We had a good time. And the, the table looks so good. Yeah. I, I saw the pictures. The table does look really good. So I'm, I'm really pleased with it. Are you going to pick up the other, the Space Marine? Was it the Castellax? Yeah, I, I kind of want to. Uh, I'm holding off at the right, moment right. just because I've spent a lot of money lately. And because I have a lot that I need to get painted. Mm-hmm. And I, I've just got such a backlog, again, even with the Kanban board. Because I made some good trades. That I'm kind of holding off on mm-hmm. buying more of that. I, and, and in addition to my luck with the cities, right. uh, escape tiles and Forge World sending the wrong ones and then sending the right ones. I have so many of those now. I don't right. feel like a need. Like, oh, I need another tile. I'm loaded with tiles at right. the moment. Right. And uh, I want to get the cityscape stuff done because I want to do the next battle on the cityscape tiles. So mm-hmm. I have to build some of those buildings to get right. Them. Get them correct. I mean, I could do it without it. I have plenty of buildings. Any but, thoughts about painting them? Uh, I'm going back and forth on a couple ideas. Okay. So, the I, I although like the gray and dark and washed stuff looks good, it's kind of dull too. Mm-hmm. But well, I mean, with the table being gray like that, right? So what's it's, it's the, almost too much, right? So what's the back of to that fourth then? What's what's the alternative there? I don't know. I mean, I could do buildings in various colors. I could do different. Mm. different colors on them uh, before I had some that were green, some that were gold mm-hmm. and painted all over right. all right. of those. What does Forge World do? I mean, what, what was Very similar to what I'd started with my buildings already. Just all gray? They're gray. They have like some burned out areas and they have some browns on them as well. Okay. Mm. So I might do some of that as well. I, I think definitely you've got that Aquila, like the temple thing. Yeah. Whatever it is. That one will be like the marble colored. Yeah. Yeah. So having a few accent pieces like that might help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think the table's going to be super fun to play on when it's done, though. Yeah. So, I mean, you can already play on it. Right. (laughs) Right. Anyway, but that's it. I mean, I had a good Thanksgiving. How was your Thanksgiving other than that? Uh, I worked. No. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I'm glad I could bring that that painful memory. Uh, but no, I had a good had a good set of days off. Got a lot of gaming in. Uh, we were able to play a lot. Also played a full game of Relic. Yes, didn't mention that. Right, it's fun. It is fun. It's it, it's talisman. It is talisman. Uh, but streamlined in areas. I mean, it's kind of cleaned up in some areas. But here's yeah. the thing: like, have you played a full game of it yet? Yeah, <clears throat> a couple. I think. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> it's so funny because when you start off, you're like, okay, I'm, i of course, playing the Ultramarine Captain. Uh-huh. I'm like, all right, and I think Ryan was playing the Ogryn. Mm-hmm. It's like first encounter, Bloodthirster. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like right. what the hell? Yeah, <laughs> like, and and it just like mops the floor with me. So I like, okay, I go, every, like it seemed like initially all the encounters that I was coming across were incredibly difficult to beat. Mm-hmm. Once you start leveling your guy, though, I mean, the thing is. Even if you lose, you only lose one wound, right? Right, so it's not too bad. Once you start leveling, all of a sudden you get to a point like like in Talisman where you're just right. like wasting the creatures it, that are coming at you. It, equipment has a lot to do with it in this game. Very I much so. I, I can't stress that enough that you got to go through the equipment. Not all of it's great, right? You don't pick all of it up, but you definitely there's pieces that you're going to want to grab. Yeah, it helps tremendously. Yeah. And we were not getting any equipment initially, and then finally once mm-hmm. that started to to lend itself to to how we saw how it helped Mm -hmm. i started hitting the equipment place over and over again yeah and but it was fun i mean we had a great time the artwork on that board is amazing amazing and i i really felt like it was an enjoyable game i don't know if it was super immersive in the 40k like universe Mm -hmm. but i mean certainly everything is you know i mean it's like oh gene stealers and the interesting thing too is and I don't know if I don't remember if Talisman is this way, but if you're fighting monsters of a similar type, they add their 
their stats together. So, I mean, suddenly they're like much tougher to fight. Right. right. But, uh, but yeah, we had a great time playing it. Uh, the thing we, we ended up fighting Fate Weaver at the end, which was an interesting battle as well. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. The, I think the thing about it, though, is when you put it in the 40K universe the way that they've done, it is themed like a cooperative game. And there's certain cards where it allows you to work together. To work together, right? Yeah. You can teleport your buddy over to help you fight Gazgul and stuff like that. But then and you both get a benefit out of that. Right. But then you're still trying to win the game. Yeah. And it, it's just a weird kind of, this feels like it should be cooperative, but it's not. But it's not. And there's a whole lot of luck involved in the game, which oh, has always, yeah. always been our it's issue with Talisman. Right. right. Ro- roll a die, move, move a number of squares. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's also what makes it take forever sometimes. It can, yeah. It's, I mean, it's definitely, you don't sit down and say, let's just knock out a quick game of Relic. No, yeah, it it's going to be an afternoon. Yeah. Uh, and, and it got to the point, too, and this is the other thing, is like the mechanics can get to a point where once I actually got to Fate Weaver mm-hmm. and, and started to fight him, I had in my hand a card that it once I got to one health, mm-hmm. I achieved whatever it is you collect, like a... a to get to relics, I achieve mm-hmm. like whatever the victory point condition was. I can't remember. And suddenly I go to full health again. Right. So I realized very quickly in my fight with, with fate, we were, I was like, I cannot lose. Mm-hmm. I, I can't lose. And, and, but I will say Ryan was one step behind me the whole time. Like he was one point behind me, but it mm-hmm. got to the point where I realized I'm not going to lose this battle. You have the potential to lose. Right. And and so I've I've won the game. It was just the two of you playing. <clears throat> yeah, the yeah. game does tend to have a runaway leader problem, though. Yeah, Someone, because yeah, I, I have seen start, that with Talisman. Once people. you start doing well, you continue to do well. You collect more stuff, you get more rewards, and then people that have it's very luck dependent, right? Mm-hmm. They hit that hard monster, you know, they get knocked out pretty early on. And, and it's not even the early on stuff. It's when you get halfway through, you've started building your stuff, and then, and then you, you get <laughs> smacked down, and yeah. you're like, okay, well, now I'm way behind everyone else that's still it's doing It's almost well. not even worth continuing yeah. at that point. Yeah. And, and you know you got another two hours ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. But it was it was fun, and, and I, I was glad to finally get to play the whole thing, because mm-hmm. I own the game, and I've yet to sit down and play a whole game of it. So that was it. That was my holiday. Uh, why don't we come back, and, and we'll start talking about Horus Heresy 2, our, our second part of our two-parter. We're going to talk about campaign system. We're going to talk about some of the characters, mm-hmm. some of the, the more crunchy bits of it, the rules, as opposed to the fluff that we talked about last time. So uh, stick with us. We'll be right back. Do you want to immediately improve the way your models look? Secret Weapon Miniatures is your one-stop shop for quickly and easily increasing the presentation of your models. With resin bases, custom conversion bits, weathering pigments, scenics, and brass etch, they have the low prices and high-quality products you're looking for. The all-in-one scenic kits are incredible. It's everything you need to make your own bases in one kit. And there are some amazing conversion bits, head swaps, backpacks, helmet crests, and even tiny scale shell casings. You won't find those anywhere else. If you're looking to make that battlefield or base look just a little more dangerous, it's all about the brass razor wire. You get more than 18 feet of this stuff, and it's actual razor wire, not that wire wrapped around that wire stuff that certain other companies try to pass off as razor wire. Plus, there's how-to videos right there on the product page, so you can see how easy all of this stuff is to work with. This is Carl from The Independent Characters. I just attended a tank masterclass workshop taught by Justin of Secret Weapon Miniatures, and I was amazed at how easy these products are to use. If you think making your vehicles look like they just came off the battlefield is difficult, you're going to be surprised at just how simple it really is. Visit Secret Weapon Miniatures at secretweaponminiatures.com for more information. And don't forget to use the coupon code IC Podcast to get 10% off your order with Secret Weapon Miniatures. The following segment is brought to you by KR Multicase. KR Multicase is the model transport and storage solution. With the Kaiser card case system or their wide selection of aluminum cases, KR Multicase has your answer for safely and affordably protecting your hard work. Remember, soft foam to protect your miniatures, hard cases to protect the soft foam. You can learn more at krmulticase.com or krmulticase.co.uk. Okay, and we're back, and we're in part two of our coverage for Horus Heresy 2 Massacre. And uh, let's start talking about the campaign system a little bit, Jeff. Now, we've, we've seen this before. Uh, we've seen it kind of, kind of evolving over the last few Imperial Armor books right. and through uh, Horus Heresy 1, and then in particular through Imperial Armor 12. I think mm-hmm. we saw like the latest version of, of this system. Right. Uh, but basically, this is how the campaign system works. 
It's broken down into three different rounds, and you're going to play a round for a given period of time or a given number of games being played. Mm -hmm. So we may have, and you can have as many people actually playing as you want. At minimum, obviously, you have to have two people. Right. But it's designed to handle up to dozens of people if you really wanted to, to do that. But let's say you and I decide to play a game. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could say, okay, we're going to round one is going to take three weeks or seven games because right. maybe we get a lot of games in usually, which <laughs> this is no. not really, <laughs> this is not based in real life here, Jeff. But let's say we play a lot. We play on average seven games uh, in in a three week given period, so we mm-hmm. so we kind of gauge how many games we typically play, and we say, okay, we're, for round one is going to be seven games or three weeks, whichever comes first, right. before we move on to round two. Mm-hmm. Each round typically represents, or in in this one, represents a phase of the battle mm-hmm. narratively. Right. Uh, round one in this case is titled the Loyalist Strike, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the initial strike of the Loyalists against the first four legions that we talked about in the last show the ones that we talked about in when we talked about book one right betrayal right exactly and so the cool thing about this system is in round one there are certain things that apply to both armies because of the phase of the battle so for example as we said it's called the loyalist strike in this one in round one the loyalist forces in this campaign uh, no loyalist army can take any type of fortification right. because this represents them dropping down. Mm-hmm. Uh, the loyalist army gains a plus one role to determine who goes first in missions, and loyalist forces cannot use the well in this book the optional Castellan battles in the Age of Darkness four sword chart. And we'll talk Which about we'll four sword charts in a mm-hmm. bit. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the other side, the traitor forces. Uh, They may always take additional fortifications as part of their primary detachment. And trader armies can add plus one on all their reserve rolls because they're, in essence, waiting for the the loyalists to strike. Mm -hmm. And uh, they may not use any of the optional onslaught battles in the Age of Darkness force org chart. And we'll talk about that, too. Because there's actually several different force org charts added that you can choose from to play in any particular game. Mm Mm-hmm. So, as, as we said before, it's broken down into three phases, and the way this works is we would play for a given period of time or number of games, and then we would move on to phase two. Mm-hmm. There's optional rules between each phase as well that could be, say, I have a particular independent character that if this independent character is killed in the game, you roll on a table and it determines uh, you can't use this guy for the rest of the turn, mm-hmm. or uh, excuse me, the rest of the, uh, the round. The round. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't, uh, maybe he's injured, so he has some other detrimental effect applied to him. Yeah. The neat thing is that it, it also goes into like shaking the morale of your side. And so it can affect your warlord, no matter if that's the same character or not, which is kind of neat. Usually what we see is as you were saying, the, the injuries and that kind of thing that carry forward only for that character. But this one actually has kind of farther reaching effects. And I think really leads into the fluff of the, what's going on a mm-hmm. little bit better. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not just about the individual battles being fought, but it's about the you know the massacre that's going on and how that's playing with each side's psyche and what that's doing to them. Right, right. So as you go through the round that mm-hmm. you're playing in, you accumulate what are uh, victory points, right? Campaign, campaign points. Right. The one other caveat to this is that there's also what's called a legendary mission Mm -hmm. that could be played once each round. Yeah, and this goes all the way back to the Bad App War. Right, exactly. This is a special mission that's worth more Mm -hmm. campaign points than the regular missions. So once you have, let's say I win round one, Jeff. I I achieve more campaign points than you do. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, What does that mean? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean... I've I've won that round, but I roll on a table now. Mm -hmm. There's a table that applies, and it changes weight, that the the table's weighted. And I may roll on this table and determine how many strategic points I have won Mm -hmm. during that round. Strategic points are what you're ultimately after. This is what wins you the campaign, as it were. Right, and the reason this is weighted is because some rounds are going to be... Uh, they're asymmetrical. I mean, yeah. it's going to be easier for one side to win some of these games than the other side. Right. So, for example, it's really weighted in favor 
of the loyalists in right. the first round. Right. Right. I mean, the, the whole storyline, if you're following it, as we said earlier, is mm-hmm. the loyalists come down. It looks everything looks great. They're kicking ass. Yep. And then the traitors are really revealed and things swing against them. So mm-hmm. if the loyalists are winning early on, they are accumulating quite a few points. However, towards the end of, of the campaign, when the traitors begin to get bolstered and reinforced, suddenly they're going to have be more likely to win mm-hmm. to win games. It's really a cool system. We've talked about it, as we mentioned before, Mm -hmm. and I think it works really well. The thing I like about it is that it's honestly fairly straightforward. There's no adjustments to things like army size, as I talked about during the hobby progress section. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's nothing that you can kind of forget or leave behind. You just go and you play a game. And uh, as I said, phase one, the loyalists strike. Phase two, the Imperium bleeds. Mm -hmm. And phase three, blood and treachery. And these are the three phases of part two of Mm -hmm. what what amounts to the overarching uh, Horus Heresy campaign. And this deals all with the battle in the Urgul Depression Mm -hmm. and the the betrayal of the loyalist marines that are on the planet. Yeah, the, the drop site massacre. Now, the cool thing about the flexibility of the campaign system is it allows you to play any kind of game that you really want each mm-hmm. round. Mm-hmm. However, if you really want to get into it and get into this specific campaign, they've also provided four missions that are specific as well. So if you and I decide to play a game, we can roll on this table and say, okay, we're going to play one of these four missions. Right. The table will change based on the round you're in, mm-hmm. on how likely what type of mission is is going to show up or whatnot. But all of the missions are detailed in the book. They're, they're pretty interesting missions. Yeah. And the whole system really, we've seen now, has, has evolved over several years actually now. Mm-hmm. And I think it's been refined to a really fluid and, and good point. In speaking with John French, who helped come up with this system originally, I mean, one of the interesting things he brought up about it was that they wanted a system that was so flexible that it didn't matter what kind of game you played. Right. Right. You and I could absolutely say, you know, it's it's fine. Why don't we just play a Zone Mortalis mission to determine this game this round? Yeah. And that's completely acceptable. We could also, it's flexible enough, we could play a Zone Mortalis campaign using these rules. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But even beyond that... The, the bare bones, that is. Yeah, yeah. Missions are not Zone Mortalis. Cl- right? Clearly. But, but beyond that... Uh, it's so flexible. If you and I were really into, say, Dawn of War the video game, yeah. we could play a round of Dawn of War the video game and say, hey, you know, the victor, wins, to, the, right? to the victor here, you know, gets a vic- uh, strategic point, or excuse me, a uh, campaign point mm-hmm. uh, for, for this battle. So it's really flexible. It, time-wise, it's flexible. If people leave, it's pretty flexible. Uh, there's rules in here for if, the campaign suddenly gets way out of balance. Maybe right. you have one side that a bunch of people have left. You can have somebody turn traitor and and right. jump to the other side with everybody's agreement. Yeah, um, it's not necessary to do that. I think though, because I mean, it, it's counting the number of games. And so, let's say there's only two traitor players and four loyalists. I mean, they're still generally only going to be playing one on one or two on two. Correct. So it doesn't. Correct really matter if the sides get lopsided unless they're like so lopsided that nobody's getting in a game like if it's five to one and i'm like well you know i can't play all of you you know uh but but yeah i mean if if we're playing with two groups of 10 people and one group has seven people i don't think that really matters right uh but it, it does but the other thing it offers quite frankly is maybe you're starting the game and you realize one player is tremendously more skilled than another group and and so you guys are going to have a runaway victory. It makes it possible to swap that player to the other group, maybe to help them out or, right. or something along those lines right. to make it a, a closer game. So we don't have the relic runaway problem that yeah. we talked about <laughs> earlier. The Imperium bleeds, which is phase two of this has a really interesting feature that goes on during it. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that Yeah, because as I was reading this in, in doing all the research, I thought this was pretty cool. Now, mind you in, in these games, they are considered to be, between two and three thousand point games, right? Using the four sorgs that are presented here, that we're going to talk about in a bit, uh, they are intended to be much. They're intended to be larger games of forty k. They're not intended to thirty necessi- k. Or excuse me, thirty k. <laughs> <laughs> Warhammer, yeah, future Warhammer. Uh, they are in. 
so these are not games that are typically, I think, going to be played very fast. They're going to take a long time. Right. It's really about telling the story, mm-hmm. and it's really about experiencing the battlefield. And I mean, when when you put all of that together, I think is when you get the best experience. But one of the cool things about Phase Two is this rule that's called Allied Bombardment, and basically what it yes. is is from the second turn onward, each side can attempt to call an Allied Bombardment. And this can only be successfully done once per game, and the attempt is completely optional. I, I'm so glad that you brought this up, because this is, I think, something that players have kind of... Uh, it's not new, it's not no. particular, but I like seeing it written in print. But it's you're talking about off-board artillery yes. or some sort Titans of Titans are off in the distance firing yeah, things. Yeah, or- so you don't necessarily have to have these giant models in order to represent them having an yeah. impact on the little section of this battle that you're having here, right? I mean, we don't have to have these giant Reaver Titans and things like that to say, all right, well, that Reaver Titan that's, you know... A mile away. Yeah, a mile away just hit this table with a big blast. Yeah, and and the cool thing is... So I'll talk about this rule, and then I'll talk about the application of it a little bit. Right. But but the player can call in a, a bombardment, and they have to roll a D6 and consult a table. And so on a roll of one, they have garbled communications, mm-hmm. and the opposing player gets to place the bombardment, which is pretty badass right? and really no good. Now, does that count as a su- successful bombardment? Oh, that's a good question. It doesn't say specifically. Right. I would say probably not. I would say that's kind so of So do you get to use the rule again? I would allow you to use it again. Okay. Uh, the two to four is no luck. The, there's no bombardment this turn. And right. this is kind of representing you like calling in for fire, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then a five plus, you get success, and the controlling player gets to call in the bombardment. And it's an unlimited range. It has to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's strength two die six. And on an 11 or 12, it's counted as a destroyer attack, right. which right. is pretty awesome. Yeah. Otherwise, it's AP3, barrage one, large blast with armor bane. So it's pretty good at taking out vehicles mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. well. So here's the thing. I mean, I think narratively, this is a really, really cool rule. I think it sounds like a lot of fun. And the thing I wanted to stress is when I, when I read about this part of the horse heresy and the Black Library stuff, and they talk about the Urgle Depression, and there's mm-hmm. this fight, I kind of pictured like just this big crater, right? which is in essence kind of what it is, but it's massive. Yeah, I mean, it's really huge. Big. Yeah, yeah I, I, I never really kind of got the scale but you're talking like hundreds of thousands of space marines are fighting each yeah. other in this thing this is an enormous battle mm-hmm. and until i kind of read this and just put it into perspective of offboard artillery is being called in to hit guys it just never really occurred to me just the sheer scale and scope of this battle this is a pretty decisive and enormous battle mm-hmm. uh in in the horus heresy thing so anyway i, I, I really wanted to touch on that one because i thought that was a neat idea mm-hmm. And the thing about this book is, and the campaign as well, is it's littered with cool ideas right. that you can take and place in any other kind of game that you're playing yep. and, and have fun with. Yeah, There's nothing to say that that particular rule is limited to this campaign. Like I said, I mean, players have been using these sorts of mechanics, but to have it written out for us is, is quite handy, I think. And the implementation of it is very straightforward, right? It's not a complex rule set. I don't have to I don't have to really roll on a dozen charts, right? It's one chart. What, does it happen or does it not, right? And you're talking about a D6 roll. So I, I think it's very straightforward, very easy to use. Um, yeah, I, I'm very excited about it. I, I am glad that you brought attention to that. So also, so I mean, that's the campaign system as well. I don't want to go over all, all the mission types or, mm-hmm. or uh, all, each, of, each of the rounds, as I said. We, we kind of gave the the thematic feel of them. Yeah. What I want to talk about though is battles in the age of darkness, which is really kind of the precursor to the campaign system. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. we've talked about the campaign system so much now. Now battles in the age of darkness is really interesting. As I mentioned before, they are roughly between 2000 and 3000 points is the intention. 25% of your force can be applied to what is called a Lord of war. Mm -hmm. And, I'm sure everybody by now has heard the term Lord of War since Escalation has come out. But in the Horse Heresy books... I think we should call it the big (laughs) E-bomb. GW dropped the E-bomb. Armies have choices here on different types of force organization charts that they want to choose. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of 
it's kind of cool. This is something we've talked about for actually a long time is yeah. we would like to see some things that change the force org chart. And right. we've seen it now in a couple books. And I, I really do appreciate what, what they've done here. But basically you have four different organizational charts mm-hmm. here that you can choose from. One is called the battle in the ages of darkness force organization chart for, uh, it's the standard chart. So it's what you would have found in, Book one, but right, right. it's the only chart that appears there, and it looks just like the 40K chart, Yep, except that it adds the Lord of War optional slot. Right, which is called optional here. I just right. want to point that out. Right. Uh, additionally, there is the optional uh, onslaught force organization chart, and in this one, your requirements in this case are a HQ, one troop, and a heavy unit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it also gives you access to... Four elites, four heavies in total, and two lords of war. Right. I should say that the the first one that we mentioned does give you four elites, so it's not exactly like right. the 40K chart. But. Right. Correct. Then you have the optional Castellan force organization chart, mm-hmm. and in this one, you have one HQ, three troops, but then you also have a fortification, which is a... A, required, uh, required, right. mm-hmm. and you can take up to three more fortifications for right. a total of four fortifications. In that, that one you're limited to two elite slots, but a total of uh, six troops, one fast attack, and uh, three heavy slots. And then you have the allied detachment, which is pretty standard at this mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. All those are cool and and very very fun. I Remember think. too that they're also limited by the <clears throat> phase that you're in. Yes. Of if you're playing through the campaign system, not every army will have access to every single force org chart at every point during the campaign. A great point. As we just mentioned in, in round one of the campaign, the traders cannot take this castle in force org chart. The loyalists cannot. Or excuse me, the loyalists cannot. The, right. the traders can. Uh, the loyalists cannot take this one. Uh, and then you have what is called the optional Leviathan force organization right. chart. This is one that we had to look at and kind of interpret a couple times. Mm-hmm. But basically, your primary detachment and HQ, I should mention, is a Lord of War, mm-hmm. and this must be a war machine or a gargantuan, or a gargantuan creature. So it's not a Primarch. Right. Uh, and in addition to that, you, get, you have the ability to take two more Lords of War, mm-hmm. and then you can take an allied detachment, which is optional. Right. This is really for those games that we've called bring down the titan right uh this is where hey you bring two or three giant things and i'm bringing you know three thousand points against you Mm -hmm. to see what i can do yep Uh, i think we talked about just playing a normal game using these rules Mm -hmm. and using uh what's his name angrath the unbound over there for 888 points against a bunch of gray knights and maybe i throw in some demons and stuff it could make for a very fun game and speaking of fun and thematic games Uh, Alan Bly, who wrote this, actually has a note about this particular detachment. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to read this from the book here because this is a really interesting point. And this applies to all of the alternative force organization charts. He says that these alternative charts are created with fun and narrative play rather than pure competitive balance in mind and should be treated accordingly. This is particularly the case with the Leviathan option, which, for example, provides a rules framework for that Age-old question, could a Space Marine company take out a Reaver Titan and similar entertaining matchups? So I think that point goes right to the heart of this entire book, which is it is a narrative recreation Mm -hmm. of the greatest turmoil in the Imperium's history. And uh, I think it just should be treated as such. I mean, really, to me, this speaks fundamentally to how 40K and 30K is as a game. But if you're thinking, oh, these are going to have an impact on tournament play or that kind of thing. It's absolutely not. And, and it's probably not even designed to be played at that kind of competitive level. No, I, I, <laughs> well, I think mean, it that, says right there it's yeah, not, not made to be. I, I think that goes, it's a very timely discussion that we don't want to go into too deeply. But certainly if you're going into these books looking for yeah, that next great rule that's going to take your army to the next level, you're probably looking at it with something that's going to do a disservice to you as a player, do a disservice to the army that you're playing. I mean, I'm sure those things are in here, but that's not what they're intended to be used for. They're intended to be used, as you said, as narrative recreations of a fictional space battle universe. Exactly. 
So, uh, I mean, overall, it tells an amazing story. I, I think it's handled an amazing and complicated and complex story very well. I like the map that breaks down, like, here's where each of the legions are fighting, so mm-hmm. you can get a little bit of frame of reference for some of the visuals and, and some of the, the actual larger tactics that are going on involved yep. in the yep. game. This by no means precludes you from playing a game, maybe your Salamander versus my Sons of Horus, but we're in a different sector. Right, right. It, as we mentioned before, it's pure chaos, yeah. no pun intended, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and people are everywhere, so it's absolutely likely that these groups are, are fighting. And typically, I mean, we're playing at most with maybe 100 Space Marines, if you're playing a total that's Space a Marine. Yeah, that's a ton, yeah. and that's a, that's a dot. It's a lot of money. <laughs> but that's a dot. In the, it's a, that's a grain of sand in the battle that's going right. on right. In, in this sandbox. So uh, it, it's a fascinating read. The missions sound exciting. Mm-hmm. The crazy thing is we always talk about, we read these books and we're like, oh, we totally got to do this. And then we never seem to have time. And we just got to set aside some time to play some of these. So mm-hmm. I, I really don't think like the Leviathan thing would take particularly long to even set up no, and play. No, I so. don't think so. So anyway, uh, let's move on from the campaign and from the, the setup and missions and that kind of thing and talk a little bit about, there's an appendix that's added here for enhancements to the forces that were in Horus Heresy Book 1. Mm-hmm. So we're talking then about some new special characters, a few a few types of items, maybe like a Bane Strike Bolter Rounds, which are something right. that the Sons of Horus get access to, uh, Reaver Attack Squads, which are also Sons of Horus, Legion only. Mm-hmm. So as after Book 1 came out, you know, Clearly, more things happen, and this is—I think—we're going to see more of this because, especially for the Trader Legions, right? They're the, changing, yeah, rapidly as they begin to devolve and, mm-hmm. or I guess, evolve. I really depends on your point, right? Yeah, you would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for example, the cacophony, mm-hmm. uh, the kind of precursor to noise marines, are, are starting to show up in here, and and so we'll—I think you're going to see more and more of that, and I, I'm going to be curious, and in fact, I. I'm pretty much certain we're going to see different versions of Primarchs as well. I imagine Horus mm. is probably going to change between now and the Battle for Terra in quite a way. Interesting. That's an interesting idea. Do you think just rules-wise or model-wise, too? Th- physically, he changes You think there's going to be multiple model releases I, for different I, Primarchs? They could. They absolutely could. I mean, why could they not? You right. Know? right. Well, I mean, I'd like is... to see him get through... Yeah, I mean <laughs> some first before I see my third Horus. I right. want to see I want to see Vulcan, right? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, well, we've seen. Okay, so I'm going to throw out a huge spoiler alert here. <laughs> so you go ahead and skip forward ten seconds if you want. But we've seen how Angron changes. Mm-hmm. Not even halfway through the Horus here. Right. I mean, he ascends at a certain point, and so now I mean we you know. What do you use for him? Well, he's some kind of bloodthirster type right. guy. So, I mean, so I, I think we have the potential to see multiple versions of Primarchs at some point. I mean, I think they need to get through some of the basics initially. We're yeah. waiting for Vulcan. We're waiting for, you know, a bunch of the guys who haven't shown up yet. So, right, right. You also get some new characters here. And some of these characters we have seen already models for. Uh, so we've seen some of the word bearer characters that have come out. Mm-hmm. You have Malagurst, uh, who the Twisted, who's one of the sons of Horus here, uh, represented as a character. He's freaking awesome. Um, and in each of these character descriptions, I noticed, because I don't think they did this in the first book. You have the first book there, Jeff. But uh, they have a lot of pen and ink sketches. And we talked about this in the previous one. And I think there's a few there, but there's certainly more in this book than there were in the first one. No, I mean, in this one, for instance, I can turn to the page of Horus the War Master. And, and there's nothing. Nice, there, yeah, there's no. There's a picture of a, a Titan and it's like a maybe a Land Raider. But or that's all the Spartan background. Tank or something. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, we have the Red Butchers, which add to the World Eaters. You know, uh, we have the Emperor's Children, as I just mentioned, with the uh, Sonic Shriekers and the Phoenix Terminator squads. Mm-hmm. All these things that we have seen models of. Uh, coming out, the aforementioned uh, cacophony of the emperor's children. Yeah, and we've we've seen these models starting to come out, and now they actually have rules here representing those. We've seen them in black library books as well. I mean, so some of these things are going to be kind of new. I don't recall ever hearing about a reaver squad in the Sons of Horus, but I have heard about the cacophony, and I have heard about the Phoenix Terminators. I mean, all through 
Fulgrim, you get these really iconic depictions of what the Emperor's children look like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. both before and after the fall. And it's really neat to be able to see physical representations of that now. Yeah. Yeah. Available for purchase. One, <laughs> one of the other uh, cool things, and, and ultimately, this is what really drives, I think, a lot of people to the Horus Heresy series is they've heard for so long about historical characters and, and whatnot. Now getting to see them on the table kind mm-hmm. of for the first times mm-hmm. is is really exciting. You have uh, Callus Typhon, Captain Typhon, who ends up becoming Typhus, mm-hmm. you know, represented here before he falls and becomes the herald of Nurgle at that point. He's so. still kind of a dick before he falls, too. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not saying he's not. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, he has some some really interesting rules associated with him. He, if he's part of your army, then he'll always be the warlord in regards to his leadership score or other HQ choices, unless Moratorian is present, right? Um, right. <laughs> he doesn't have to roll on the warlord table. He's a level one psyker, so mm-hmm. he's, you know, he's still at the beginning kind of phases of, of his of his transition, but he, he's an interesting character. And they, again, they, they show a depiction of him before he becomes bloated and right. And, and fly, fly bound next. Uh, before we move into the Legion lists that are listed here. So for example, we have the iron hands, the night Lords, the salamanders, the word bearers. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk a little bit about just units that stood out for you uh, in each of the ones that you covered. I wanted to mention that uh, in talking, I, I was talking with somebody recently, you'll go unnamed and, and they were talking about our coverage last episode about Kurz in particular. And mm-hmm. they raised a really interesting point. Uh, because I had said how Kurz was really like, why would you choose this guy to lead a legion from the right. beginning? Clearly he's got problems and right, this, that, right. and the other thing. Uh, the points that he made were that Kurz had a somewhat twisted of everything is just black or white, right? This, these people mm-hmm. are bad or these people are good. And pretty much everywhere on Nostromo, everybody's bad. Yeah, right. Uh, so the interesting point he brought up, though, was uh, had he not been scattered from when the Primarchs were being born, mm-hmm. do you think he would have had that type of outlook and that type of attitude? So say, say the Emperor's plan actually worked where all the Primarchs are born on quote unquote born Mm -hmm. and they're able to deal with his tutelage like he's able to to teach them and and guide them Mm -hmm. curse one of the things that drives him mad is his visions that Mm -hmm. he has and as the heresy goes further and further he goes more and more insane basically do you think that it was intended that he have these visions and if he were born and raised on terra and the emperor was able to guide him and and help him probably even psychically maybe help him Mm mm-hmm I mean, maybe Kurz wouldn't have been the <laughs> the maniac we end up finding out. He would. you think so? I don't. I don't know. know. I, don't I don't know either. Know. It's an, it is an interesting question, but then I always just look back to Angron and I'm like, what else could he have been? Right? Without the butcher's nails installed, maybe he could have been something else. You think so? I don't know. I mean, this is this is an mm. interesting 40k philosophical yeah. question, <laughs> 30k <laughs> philosophical question to answer. Yeah. But but it was just. Uh, I mean, if it, and and I and I told this person, I said, well, if that's true then really the decisive blow for chaos was at that moment that the Primarchs were scattered. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really the deciding you know, factor. At that point. To them falling? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it is. I, I think that puts a lot of credit to their environment, though. Do you know what I well, mean? Well, that was the other point I made. I said, was he really a product of his environment, or was he a product of just like faulty wiring right. from the get Because they all are aspects of the Emperor, right? I mean, that's right. the idea, is that he... His personality is essentially split up into these smaller components. Right. I don't. I don't know. That's obviously a pretty big question, but interesting and worth thinking about. Yeah, it was just something I hadn't really considered before. So, uh, with that, I think what we want to do before we get into these lists, and we just get, we're going to talk kind of briefly about the things that stand out for us in each of these army lists. Why don't we take a break, and we'll come right back. And we'll start going down each of these lists, just units of note, and talk about some of the characters that we really like out of them, including Primarchs. <laughs> KR Multicase, the complete storage and transport system. My dad says it's the best way to keep his model safe and secure. It is. You can shop online from krmulticase.com for the most comprehensive range of trays, cases, and accessories for tabletop wargaming. You can choose from a wide range of core trays for troops, vehicles, and monsters. Or choose KR custom cut trays for specific models. What does that mean? 
It means you can use the KR Custom Tray Creator to define your own personal trays for your army and use the Tray Selector app to help fill your case. Are those the cardboard boxes filled with the soft blue film that Daddy has all over his game room? They are. KR has the most efficient designs for transporting wargaming miniatures. You can carry 228 millimeter figures in a standard size KR multi-case for only £21.99 in the UK and $38.99 overseas. That includes shipping costs. KR Multicase is the only fully stackable system, and the modular design enables gamers to easily swap between cases and trays to suit their gaming needs. You can choose double, triple, or quadruple aluminum or Kaiser cases for your larger armies. My dad has a KR backpack that his trays fit into also. It makes carrying his army super easy. KR, soft foam to protect your figures, hard cases to protect the soft foam. Join the boys over at Sprue Hammer, centrally isolated for access to several Western and Central Kentucky and Western Tennessee gaming groups. They're dedicated to helping new players learn every aspect of 40K and gaming in general. Check out their blog with reviews, tutorials, and general information for beginning and experienced players. And you can find them on Facebook for gaming days and information, and also at spruehammer.com. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the actual army list, the legion Mm -hmm. list that come with the book, and then we'll kind of get our final impressions of it, and we'll go from there, and we'll close out the show after that. But Jeff, let's start with the Iron Hands, since you covered those in the fluff section. Let's cover those now. So I think, I mean, kind of as I mentioned before, not super into the Iron Hands as a a legion, so I'm going to kind of blow through this pretty quickly. And actually, I listened to the coverage done by Forge the Narrative Mm -hmm. of this. And so they kind of went into the Iron Hands and pretty much skipped over the Salamanders. So if you're really interested in the Iron Hands, that might be a good place to go. Keep in mind that those guys have maybe, despite the name, I think it's a little tongue-in-cheek, actually. Uh, It's really more of a tournament-focused podcast. But they do a pretty good job. And from my understanding, the rules in here are reminiscent of the Iron Hands, the supplement that came out right things like the six plus feel no pain right that right sort of thing. the clan rock mm-hmm. ragu gun Ra- yeah Ra- 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 what it is but clan r yeah okay <laughs> there's some really neat stuff in here uh for instance there's a uh, gorgon terminator squad and these guys have normal terminator and un- dominus pattern mm-hmm. tactical dreadnought armor that kind of stuff all kinds of really neat options though i mean you can take like a gravi- graviton gun in it for mm-hmm. instance you know the grenade harnesses all those things that you would expect from playing 30k terminators they also have a rule though where if any of them makes an armor save mm-hmm. all units within six inches have to test for blindness because it takes the uh the, the impact of it and kind of turns it into energy or something like okay. that and just like projects it back out so that's Friendly and enemy, but friendly gets a re-roll on the Got it. test to go blind, that kind of stuff. What do the Iron Hands as a Legion, like, do they have special rules associated with them? Because most of the Legions do. Yeah, that's what I mean. They get, like, the, the six plus, feel no pain. Okay. Um, they get some ability to take different uh, relics and interactions with the... Uh, the feel no pain's huge. The Cybernetica. Yeah, yeah this, well, the feel, feel no pain is pretty cool. Um, I mean, even on a six plus, that's a pretty meaty. That's a pretty meaty rule across the entire legion. Mm-hmm. Um, they get stubborn in their own deployment zone. That that kind of stuff. Um, it's pretty neat. It doesn't seem like any of it's particularly game breaking. Okay, but there's some pretty neat stuff in there. I think some really cool interactions with uh, what we would know in 40k as like the tech marine side of things. Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff. What I really want to talk about though was the Medusan Immortals. Okay, which as a matter of fact, the email just came in today from Forge World. I saw the pictures. Yeah, advertising these guys. And they look freaking awesome. So essentially, they're a breacher squad. It's Mark III armor. They've got the big breacher shields with the iron hand symbol on them, that kind of stuff. But the fluff behind these guys is that, I I mentioned in the last show, that failure is not an option, right? Right. And so the way that these guys try to redeem themselves is by joining these Medusan immortal squads. Mm Mm-hmm. And so they lose all claim to their uh, their old clans and that kind of stuff. Essentially, they become like in Warhammer Fantasy, there's like the Slayer trolls. Okay. Okay. Troll Slayers, uh, the dwarves. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? Yep, I do. So they're going out to try to find themselves like a good death to, to repent for whatever wrong that they've done. 
So they get into these things, unlike the the Slayers who just throw themselves at anything big. It's very ordered. It's very, I mean, along the the same lines of what I was talking about before, where they just keep going forward, just implacably advancing and hard, steadfast, just really cold fury looking for that death in a good, uh, as in a good death. Right, right. right. And they'll just keep marching into the enemy's guns and die if they need to. So kind of neat and they have a really really cool special rule where instead of making a sweeping advance Mm -hmm. they can instead choose to snapshot on the enemy unit that broke against them in close combat why would you do that we can't sweep well you can sweep in 30k right why would you choose to overwatch instead of sweeping advance maybe they have a higher initiative than you Uh, maybe i don't know oh that's this is true well, it doesn't always necessarily be against Marines, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to think about that a little bit. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I think a stand and shoot option is kind of neat, though. <clears throat> Maybe you don't want to move. <laughs> Maybe you don't, yeah. Well, you don't have to on a sweeping advance. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to give that some thought. And then we've got uh, Ferris Manus himself. Pretty typical Primarch out of this world stats. Sixes and sevens okay. and whatnot. How many points is he? He's 455. Okay. So, I mean, if you're talking about a 25% in a 2,000-point game, that's... There's what, your 25%. 500 points, yeah. yeah. So, I think, you know, in terms of his armor, a lot of them have armor, the Primarchs, that is, that say, okay, well, he's got this crazy armor that came from such and such planet and was forged in the fires of hell itself, and you get a 2-up, 3-up. <laughs> you know, it's like... 2-up, 3-up, or 2-up, 4-up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's kind of uh, what you see a lot of times. His armor, though, is more along the lines of... If you think of like a uh, a tech marine or yeah. uh, what's the HQ tech marine for space marines? The uh, master of the forge. Yes, he can choose to fire two weapons in the same turn. It can be a plasma blaster, a graviton gun, a grenade harness, or a heavy flamer. Two in the same turn. Two I assume at the same target. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to assume. Yeah, right. it would be. It, they'd call it out specifically. Yeah, it doesn't say that you get to split them up. That's pretty badass, though. And then he gets a big-ass hammer, of course. So, yeah. Which is <laughs> pretty pretty standard. Yeah, he's for... not a slacker in close combat. No, 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 no. None of them are. I mean, they're all out of this world ridiculous, but they should be for 500 yeah, points and for $90 models. Yes. How much are these? 60 bucks, right? Uh, 50 pounds, usually, oh, is it? I think. Something along those lines. So, yeah, it's going to be a $75 model. Yeah. So, I, I think there's some really neat stuff in there, but, again, Iron Hand's not really my... Your thing? Yeah, not really my thing. So the models look freaking awesome, though. So if you are are into it, I mean, I can't see a reason not to go to Forge World and and pick some of those up. Uh, In particular, the Forge World models for those Medusan Immortals, uh, they also have a lot of cybernetics amongst them. So even if you weren't interested in making that particular squad, maybe like Carl, you can't find a good reason to shoot instead of try to run them down. Maybe you... uh, just want to use them to kit bash and, and just right. mix in with your other squads. Right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Night Lords. Um, they're actually very interesting on the battlefield mm-hmm. in the sense that I actually find their fluff less interesting than their rules in this case. And I found the rules to be really, really cool. Okay. So first off, they're Legion of Sardis, so they're space marines. Mm-hmm. But they have this thing called a talent for murder. And basically what this is is if that if their unit outnumbers the unit they are fighting against in mm-hmm. close combat, they get a plus one to wound. So uh, Terminators count as two models. So bulky and very bul- bulky count as models. So two models, very bulky, or three models. Mm-hmm. But in close combat, if I outnumber you in terms of models, then my chance to wound is one greater. Okay. So, for instance, instead of needing fours to wound, I would need threes? Is yes. that what you mean? Yes. As long as I outnumber you. That is a neat rule. I feel like it would slow a game down, though. We have two 20-ish man tactical squads mm-hmm. go crashing into each other, and now we've got to start counting models every yeah, round. You do every round anyway, because you got to figure out how many attacks you got, so it's going to happen anyway. You do, yeah, I guess. But, but you have, I have to know. Anyway, I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, they also have Nostroman blood, mm-hmm. which means they fall back uh, one inch further than normal, but here's the thing. If they fail a pinning test, they can choose to fall back instead of being pinned. That's pretty interesting. So that's pretty cool. They also have night vision. So they're cowards, essentially? Is that what it is? They tactically retreat. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just a little bit further. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hit me? Ooh. 
<laughs> uh, they have night vision, sure, which is pretty badass, right? Uh, for a space marine army, which I've never understood why space marine helmets don't just give them night vision anyway. These guys apparently have better night vision than the other guys. Yeah. Uh, but so they have night vision, but they also have this thing called From the Shadows, which on the first round of the game, they have a six plus cover save, even if they're in open terrain. Hmm. So no matter what, whether it's nighttime or not, they have a six plus cover save. And don't they get to make it night fighting? They do. They can make it night fighting on a four plus. So they can they can force it to night fighting. So even if like it failed to be a night fighting mission, mm-hmm. they can force a roll on a four plus again to try to make it night fight. Mm-hmm. That's actually the sorry. That's the Night Lord's unique right of war terror assault, mm-hmm. right? And that that's what gives them the four plus uh, night fighting. So basically, what it says is the force may impose night fighting for the duration of the first turn of any mission on a D6 roll of 4+, plus, if this condition is not already occurring in the mission normally. Mm-hmm. So I guess, I mean, what? So normally you roll to see if it's night fighting, and on yeah. a 4-up it's night fight. I am assuming this would allow you to force that again, because it's not occurring? I don't know. Actually, what it is is maybe missions that night fight doesn't occur in, you can force night fighting. That's mm-hmm. what it is. Okay. That's what it is. So I misunderstood that a little bit, so... Yeah, that's interesting. And then it carries into the second round on a five plus and under the third round on a six. Right. Which helps them tremendously, especially because they have the, the night night vision. Yeah. So uh, it, I, I don't know. I find them to be kind of an interesting chapter on the on the table. In particular, the other thing I like about them is their night raptor squads. And this is kind of one of the things mm-hmm. I touched on in the last episode. But these are assault troops in in essence, and they're jump troops. But the cool thing about them is they have a special rule called onslaught. And what this rule does is normally uh, when a model assaults, it gets plus one to its attack. Mm -hmm. This gets plus a D3 extra attacks. And it specifically says if there's multiple models involved, that D3 is applied to each model. So you roll if you roll three and you have 10 guys assaulting, that's an additional 30 attacks. Nice. Which is tremendously huge. Yeah. So these guys are really, really good in close combat assault. How many points are they? 150 points base. And for that, you you get five guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, Four four night raptors and a hunt master, the the sergeant. Uh, And I mean, you know, their weapon skill five, so they're not wusses in close combat either. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for. You can you can kit them out. Obviously, you can give them power weapons, oh, yeah. this kind of stuff. That, I, I think that needs to be said. Actually, this is a good time to say it. All of these units have a bajillion options, yeah. for weapons and and mostly weapons, I guess. But there's other war gear and stuff too. We talked about it when we talked about the first book, Betrayal. Yep, so much war gear in here. Yeah, there's just tremendous tremendous amounts in here. Any model in this squad can exchange their chain sword close combat weapon for a power weapon. For ten points, mm-hmm. an Astroman chain glaive for ten points, or a single lightning claw for fifteen points. So I mean, it can get expensive fast. You can add ten guys to this for twenty points each. Oh man, lightning claws in that squad would be freaking brutal. Think well, especially that. If, yeah, that's not twin lightning claws. That's just a single lightning claw. No, but, but you still get to reroll the wound, right? Mm-hmm. You still get uh, to isn't re-roll that for the, twin lightning? I don't think claws? so. I think that's for. That's twin just lightning. how you get the extra attack. Oh, you're right. You're right. So yeah, I mean, this is. <laughs> the 30 attacks, all re-rolling failed wounds. An, I mean, you just it's pretty much wipe right? it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That would be a really expensive unit. It's I like mean, 45 two, points a dude. 350 base points for a 15-man squad, not including any power weapons yet. Mm-hmm. So that, that's pretty pricey. But And that's why you play two to 3,000 points. But, oh, my God. And they're fast because they're, yeah. they're jump troops. So, I mean, these things, if they get into you, you are hosed. So... Pretty nice. They can also take like some melt weapons as well, so for every mm-hmm. 10 or something like that. So they can basically jump up, destroy a vehicle, you know, and then assault. <laughs> so they're not, they're not too shabby. And all it took was Forge World getting a hold of rules to make jump troops worthwhile. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, they have Conrad Kurz, who we've talked about, the white-headed stepchild of, <laughs> of, of hatred of the Imperium. Uh, 435 points. Weapon skill eight. I mean, across the board, primark, primark skill six, six, sixes, initiative seven, five attacks, eternal warrior. I mean, pretty much everything you mentioned before. But he does have a cool, uh, a few cool special rules. He's a jump troop, right? I mean, that's yeah, pretty big already. Yep, a primark that can jump around the battlefield. He's a jump infantry character. He has a couple pretty cool things. Uh, so the first thing he has is mercy and forgiveness, <laughs> which are the two. <laughs> That's so uh, 
such a misnomer. But anyway, mercy and forgiveness are his uh, pair of artificer lightning claws that mm-hmm. are AP two. They have melee, shred, special weapon, murderous strike, which is in the first uh, horse heresy book. I'm not. Mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly what murderous strike does. Uh, I think it does an instant death it, on something. Oh, geez, probably. <laughs> and they're paired, so it gives a plus one attack, as we just talked about right. earlier. So not too shabby. Uh, so in assault, if he's jumping with these things, he's getting six attacks on the charge. Unfortunately, they don't give him onslaught. He does have shrouded though, stealth. He's bulky, and he has something called the King of Terrors. And the thing is, because of his preternatural malice and his aura of of sinister intent, fear tests against him are taken at a minus three leadership penalty. So it's pretty huge, actually. It is huge, especially combined with the earlier rules where the Legion itself will cause you to make fear tests. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think this is important to say that these guys don't have, as we mentioned in the previous book, and they shall know no fear. Mm -hmm. Uh, Legions of Stardes, they regroup uh, regardless of how many guys are left in the unit, but they are not immune to fear. Mm -hmm. So uh, this does have an impact even if you're playing against just other Legions of Stardes space marines. In addition, if he's part of an assault where an enemy unit is destroyed outright, all other enemy units subject to fear within 12 inches of line of sight of that combat have to make an immediate morale test or fail back. Crazy, right? Yeah, so this guy's... I, honestly, he's pretty nasty in close combat. Uh, he has a couple other things. His artificer suit gives him a 2-plus armor save, 4-plus invuln. Mm-hmm. Also grants him hit-and-run and Hammer of Wrath attacks. And he inflicts a D3 Hammer of Wrath attacks rather than the usual plus one additional attack. So pretty, he's pretty nasty overall. Oh, oh, and then, of course, the Widowmakers. We talked about this. Yeah. The throwing knives, the Nostroman throwing knives. Mm-hmm. That uh, It's called the Widowmaker Volley. It's a 12-inch Strength 4 AP5 Assault 3 Lethal Precision Attack. So when wielded by Kurs, these weapons inflict precision strikes on a 4+. Plus, and to wound rolls of a 6, ignore both armor saves and... And invulnerable saves. Right. So that's, I, I, I don't know how often this is going to come into play, but that's pretty badass. I mean, you know, jumping against a specific model. He is jump infantry, right? And that's the, the thing is that you just have to get within 12 inches of something. I mean, you're going to charge it anyway, right? So yep. you shoot it, you kill that Kill killing power fist guy. It, or an IC or, you know. Whatever. I mean, at this point, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty That's pretty nasty. So a uh, couple other independent characters are listed here. Uh, Flaymaster Maudrim Lanshashe. <laughs> Whew, that's a mouthful. And we'll just call him the Flaymaster. And uh, Sevatar, Jago Sevatarian, the Prince of Crows. He's the first captain of the Night Lords. We talked about them last last episode where these are the guys that basically keep all the other guys in line. The uh, He's the master of the Atramintar, the... The group of uh, they, that are given all the like, best weapons and equipment. It's like the and secret police. Of yeah, their yeah, yeah. Region. That's actually exactly what it is. Uh, so, I mean, you know, overall, I think these are wow. These guys hit hard and fast. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is this is cool because this is a guy who, in the fluff for the drop site massacre, he and what's his name of the Raven Guard. Oh, um, Korax. He and Korax go toe to toe, and right. Korax basically barely escapes mm-hmm. with his life in, in this fight. I mean, he gets surprised and all that, but but uh, I can see why this guy is kind of like the anti-Korax, right? right I mean, right. They, they're both kind of wielding the same kinds of weapons and, mm-hmm. and having it out. Pretty cool character overall. I think... Uh, he has a goatee. Looks like Korax, but with a goatee. <laughs> <laughs> He's evil Spock. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I am very interested to see what they do with uh, this guy's model. Because... Yes. It's yes. going to be tricky, but I think he's going to be really, really cool. Looking. I hope he's perched up on something. Oh, that would be cool. I, I'm curious to see what they do with Korax. It would as make well. it very different than the other ones too. If yeah. he's like perched somehow. That's true. That's true. If he's like up on top of something tall, and and that would be really, really cool looking. Korax, it kind of goes along with his thing too. So I don't know. Maybe he'll be standing in front of a a guy flayed on a cross yeah, or, or something. something. I have to, I have to say. I mean, again, like I. I Reading the Night Lords and the Fluff, and I talked about this last episode where I wasn't particularly like really into this guy. As I see them on the table, I'm like, this sounds like a fun army to play. Mm-hmm. I mean, the jump infantry aspect of it seems like a lot of fun. And that's probably because I don't use jump infantry right. a lot right now. Right. 
but also these guys kick all kinds of ass. So I'd be curious to see how they actually play out on the table against some of the other legions. Yeah. So let's move on to the Salamanders, Jeff, your favorite. And actually, I mean, I'll, I'm kind of laughing as I say that, but I'm really happy that you finally got your legion addressed here. And I'm, I'm Just curious. in time for them to be all but destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> and not take part in any other Horus heresy at all. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. These guys have some really neat rules. For instance, they pass fear tests automatically and... Oh, so curse doesn't bother them. <laughs> doesn't bother them at all. They don't care. They get to re-roll one of the dice when they fail morale or pinning. Mm-hmm. They also get to add plus one strength to... You're going to hate this. Hand flamers, flamers, and heavy flamers. I don't hate that. Okay. At least it's not oh. affecting Melta, right? I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not, no, no, not at this point. Um, but they do have some drawbacks, which are also kind of fun. In the old Salamander's Fluff, they used to... I think it was they would be at initiative three or something yeah, like that. Yeah. They were slow. They were slow, mm-hmm. but they hit hard, right? That was their thing. Right. And now, for instance, they don't quite go that far, but they don't get to add their initiative to sweeping advance, and they run and charge an inch less. Whatever they roll, they subtract an inch. Yeah. That, <laughs> that is going to hurt a lot. Yeah. I think that, maybe not the sweeping advance stuff, that's whatever, but the run and charge stuff is going to just really be painful at some mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. A lot of the stuff in here also carries over from the current Space Marine Codex. So, for instance, all the characters get to get a master-crafted weapon, you know, for five points, that kind of thing. Yeah. They also, though, get access to a Storm Shield, which doesn't seem like much to 40K players, but But in 30K is a big deal. Uh, It's important to keep in mind, though, that it is a prototype Storm Shield, and so it's a 5+, plus or increases your normal invulnerable save by one. Okay. So if you give it to an independent character, for instance, it's all also rocking a whatever the 30K version of the Iron Halo is, now he gets the three up. So invul. it is, uh, I, I assume there's a maximum. Does it Does it list? Uh, yeah, three plus is the Three plus the is limit. the max. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. But that's where you're going to take people anyway. Yeah. I guess that makes sense fluff-wise. I mean, here you have it on... I mean, I can see that. Like, it's it's almost like an evolution of the Storm Shield, right? Mm-hmm. It starts out, and then really, you're only going to be giving that three plus to the really important characters at this point. Right. Whereas right. later, just like all my Terminators take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, there's some cool stuff. So, like, the uh, Mantle of the Elder Drake is a war gear option. Essentially, you can take the Adamantine Mantle yeah. that you used to be able to take in the fourth edition space marine codex i think right i think so but that came from the salamanders originally in the first place i didn't realize that and for the record i love that picture on the page yeah this is the one that we keep talking about it's the one actually at the top of our facebook page at the moment oh yeah yeah i just it's a great picture of the salamander i mean he looks really he looks threatening yeah he looks imposing really savage yeah When, when you read what was the short story where the Ultramarines were fighting against a bunch of different legions in a row? It was yeah, Graham McNeil, right? Yeah, it, actually, it was the short story where they were uh, practicing against uh, fighting. All... What's wrong with you? I'm nothing, dude. I'm just saying they were developing strategy <laughs> for... Okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> I don't want to ruin that. Sorry. Anyway, this is they described the Salamanders as being really, really savage. And this is the the picture of them that they paint with just like Got it. teeth hanging off of their armor and, you know, these like uh, really primitive fetishes and yeah. things and the Drake scale everywhere, that kind of stuff. God, it's, a neat le- it's a neat legion. Yeah. It's, a, it's a neat chapter. Like I, before you came on the scene here, I had never really heard about them or, mm-hmm. you know, I I'd heard about them on the, on the periphery uh, and, and you were the first person I knew that was actually playing them. And the more I've learned about it, the more I'm like, dang, this is a really cool chapter. Yeah, I'm I'm glad. I I when I started this army, I didn't know nearly as much about them as I do now, and I, I stand by lucked my, out. Stand, you stand by, by your choice. choice. Yeah, and you know they've got some really neat stuff. They have a way to affect Melta, and it's by taking the uh, rights of war mm-hmm. for them. The pyro class is is their special squad that they have. Mm-hmm. So I really I want models for this. I don't necessarily. They got to be coming soon. I'm not. It, it, the, the rules are cool, right? They have better flamers. They can adjust them, uh, kind of almost, almost the way that Orc, the Burna Boys, can uh-huh. like switch back and forth between these modes. Only both of these are are shooting modes instead of one being a close combat. But I really want crazy dragon head 
flamers. Yeah. That's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> I want these models to come out so I can put their guns into regular tactical squads sure. and sure. stern guard squads. It's and gotta, like they got to be working on it. I mean, it's such a popular chapter. This is the thing. I hope so. Right? It it, it really is. It's a popular chapter, and I mean, it's it's so great. <laughs> it's so It is really cool. Yeah. I got to imagine they're working on it. Uh, we've got some Fire Dragon uh, stuff here. Uh, I'm sorry, Fire Drake, the Terminator squad, yeah, which is pretty neat. Vulcan, though, 425 points. So actually fairly low in terms of mm-hmm. Primark points for what we've been talking about so far. And that's because he's fairly straightforward, yeah. I think. Yeah. He doesn't have a lot of the kind of tricks and stuff. He does get the two up, three up. Um, he has the strength of things hitting him, like Flamer, Fusion, Volkite, Melta, Plasma, which is pretty cool. Um, he has the strength has of those the things? strength so of So a, a, a Melta weapon used against him is hitting at strength four. Yes. That's awesome. It is awesome. And his toughness, toughness is seven. Six. <laughs> seven. Yeah. So, oh, my God. So, yeah, it's only wounding on a six. Right. That is awesome. He's super tough. Yeah. He's super tough. And, again, he's got... Big ass hammer. He's got a cool like area of effect uh-huh. hammer. He's just got like the ground strike thing, you know. And oh, he nice. Can, you know, attack all the guys around him. It, it just puts a blast marker anywhere and base to base with him. Mm-hmm. And so, essentially, just picture it like he reaches out, hits the ground, you know, right. an inch and a half away from him because it's a three inch marker. Right. And then that's the like seismic shock wave. That's that comes pretty out of badass. There. What's the strength of that attack, or what's the effect of it? Strength eight AP three. Holy cow! Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Right. He's a Primark. Though. Does he do this in place of his normal attacks? Yes. Or? Okay, yes. that's still, though. Right. I mean, you'd have to weigh how many attacks does he have versus this round. Yeah, I think I'm just going to keep hitting the ground around me. <laughs> yeah. I'm <laughs> that's all against I Space Marines, right? Hang on a second. Boom. I hit the ground. I don't need to roll to hit right. because it's just going to hit. Nope. Yep. That's a pretty awesome close combat ability. Right. You can't place it so that it hits friendly models, but if it's just him in combat, sure. Then- who cares? Sure. Everybody get behind me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hit this ground. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, he's got all kinds of cool stuff. He's got some guns and that sort of thing, too, that shoot. It's like a strength six, AP2, Jeez. rending, but yeah. it's a, like a line. <laughs> rending it's a line AP2. attack. <laughs> Eight, 18 inches of, of line from yeah. him. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. So pretty cool. I mean, yeah, 425 points, are, right? Are you happy with this character as your Primark? Because, I mean... Yes, I am more excited about the model than I am well, about sure. the rules. Like, Let's, I really want to see that giant freaking dragon skull on his shoulder. That's what I want to see. Right, right. You hear that, Simon? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> no, it's it's, it's, it's a neat character. And there's a, a black and white sketch of him there. Mm-hmm. And he's pretty awesome looking. Very cool stuff. And then we get to a Dreadnought HQ character. 275 points, right? Sounds. I always like the idea of Dreadnought's HQ characters. I like, I liked it since the Space Wolf Codex, right. honestly. And the other thing, too, is that the Dreadnoughts at this point are not all crazy. No, no, They no. haven't been Dreadnoughts for that long. I mean, some of them are starting to go, mm-hmm. and you can see in the legions that are already unstable, yeah, they're all crazy, right? But they're still capable of being around. Mm-hmm. Like, they... Mm-hmm. It talks about them waking them up and that kind of stuff. Right. But they aren't all crazy as soon as they wake up, so... I, I'm with you. I like the idea of it. Now, this character, Cassian Dracos, is essentially 30K Brayarth. Okay. You and I were talking a minute ago about whether or not... So he's been eaten by your dog is what you're yes. saying. <laughs> 10,000 years ago. We were kind of talking about whether or not it's supposed to represent the same sal- the, the same Dreadnought chassis. Right, right. And maybe not. I don't know. It I, think it's, like... I think it's probably the same model. Yeah. Of Dreadnought chassis. They were right. probably a little more prevalent around then, around right. that time. Yeah, because he's got the Rot by Vulcan, Vulcan rule, which mm-hmm. you know, Brayarth has that prevents him from taking you know the Melta and all that kind of stuff. Right. But the name of the chassis that it mentions is not the same, if I'm remembering correctly, is not the same as Brayarth. So <laughs> okay. it may be just another Dreadnought that Vulcan built. I got to be honest, though, if we play... 30k i'm using bray arth and i'm well, using sure. these rules i mean it's the same weapons on him and everything yeah. um he's got the same kind of uh, flamer close combat attack the heavy flamer in this case though remember the strength is increased by one which oh, is yes. awesome strength six ap4 Jeez. flamer attack yeah yeah pretty cool i guess against marines it's... against marine well he's wounding on two so yeah. i mean that's not too shabby and then we've got a um one of our we talked about chaplains a lot yep in the last show. Yes. And then, so there's the Lord Chaplain of the Salamanders nice. here, um, who's 215 points, which is pretty good 
for a chaplain. And then you realize that, I mean, essentially he's a space marine, like a captain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of stats rather than the, the chaplains that we've come to know. Okay. Carl, I think you wanted to talk about the word bearers next, right? It's the last I sure do. And this will be the one? yeah, this will be the last one we cover. And here's uh, one of the reasons that I chose the word bearers. Actually, let, let's talk about their their legion traits initially. Like all of them, they're legions of Stardis. Uh, they're true believers, which means that all units in the word bearers have a special rule to roll three d six for all morale checks, and they must pick the two lowest dice. Hmm. So pretty likely that they're going to be making morale tests. Cut them down. This is a really cool rule, actually. All units with the Legion of Sardis special rule, so basically all word bearers, all mo- must always make sweeping advances when possible, which I, I don't think it's optional anyway, a sweeping advance. I think you have to make a sweeping advance. But when they do, they can re-roll sweeping advance rolls that result in a one. So if you roll a one for your sweeping advance, you get to re-roll mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Charismatic leadership... Any primary detachment force chosen from the Word Bearers Legion uh, must take a secondary, uh, excuse me, a second compulsory HQ choice on the force organization chart when that second choice is allowed. Uh, so this choice must always be either a Centurion or Chaplain Consul. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, in the fluff, the Word Bearers, as we know, are pretty much responsible for the, the birth of the heresy. Mm-hmm. And... I think they uh, see themselves as uh, apostles and and the bearers of that word and and leaders in in a in a in the in that way right mm-hmm. they're they're yes. uh, inspiring the others to that that's where their power their true power comes from mm-hmm. so they have access to a couple other uh, things in addition to the crusade army list. Uh, so now I wanted to jump into their kind, their right of war, the the dark brethren mm-hmm. for the word bearers. This is what really caught your attention, right? This is why. This is part of the reason I'm choosing word bearers. I honestly, the art inspired me to do word bearers in this from the get go. I, quite frankly, I almost did word bearers originally before I did the world eaters. Mm-hmm. But I did the world eaters because at the time those were the forge world bits available, and I right, really liked right. that look. But the word bearers have always kind of been interesting to me. I was kind of backing off doing them because I didn't want to do another red army. But now I'm kind of. Are you committing now, or are you? I, still... I'm pretty much committed at this moment to do word bearers. Huh. I haven't pulled the trigger and bought anything yet, and that's okay. the ultimate sign of sure commitment. But if I'm leaning any particular way, it's because I'm it's word bearers at this moment. Okay, and there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, these guys are arch traders. So all independent characters in the detachment use the right of war for the Dark Brethren. They gain preferred enemy against Loyalist Space Marines, special rule. They have something called signs and portents. And the controlling player basically gets to select a single unit at the beginning of the game uh, from the primary detachment. And they roll a D6. And on a 1 to 3, all opposing units count as having the preferred enemy rule against that unit. So your mm-hmm. your opponent basically gets preferred enemy against that specific unit. Yeah. But on a four to six, your unit counts as having preferred enemy special rule against all opposing units. You follow me? I do follow. But don't they already get preferred enemy against Space Marines? Against Loyalist Space Marines. This okay. is against anything else. Okay. Right? In addition to that, they have this thing called From Beyond, which means the primary detachment with this right of war can take... Uh, allies from Codex Chaos Demons. Mm-hmm. This is the other half of what sold me on this army. First off, I've always been a huge fan of Chaos Space Marines pulling in demons. That was one of the things that attracted me to the army to begin with. I right. just I like the mix of the terror of these demons mm-hmm. and these guys, you know, summoning them, and and I like the mix of honestly having monstrous creatures in combination with my armor and that kind of thing. It makes for a very fun experience for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. But the other thing I like is that the mix of this is going to reduce the cost of buying this 30k <laughs> army, right? Because I can already supplement it with a bunch of demons I have. But I have to really give some thought to like what kind of demons I want to use with the word bears. I mean, the thing is they're kind of non-denominational, yeah. <laughs> so right. they can really pick from whatever you want as a, as an ally list, and I think that gives them a whole bunch of flexibility. Do you see Forge World coming out with a unit of demons, like Forge World Chaos Furies or something like That'd that? That'd be kind of cool. I don't know like that... The Chaos Undivided. I have a feeling that's kind of low on their priority list I at would this imagine point. so. Yeah, but uh, 
but there, there's certainly that potential. And then here's the other thing that I really, really like, and it's called Hell Follows With Them. And basically what this means is that all wounds that are caused by perils of the warp tests taken by the opposing force mm-hmm. have the instant death special rule applied to them, which is not going to come in play very often. But when it does, it's going to pop an enemy HQ as long as it doesn't have Eternal Warrior pretty quickly. Especially since there's no invuln save against... Right. Yeah. yeah. That is, it's going to be pretty strong, yeah. Like you said, it's not going to happen often, but when it does, it's going to be big. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, there's... there's Honestly, there's several units here. The Gulvarbach that we talked about before, the Ashen Circle, which mm-hmm. is, you know, the... You have the Galvor Bach, you have the Ashen Circle. The Ashen Circle are the ones we talked about before. Like their objective is to uh, jump in and destroy like uh, unique structures of faith and and burn books right. and that kind of thing. Right. So they have like all kinds of flamers and melta bombs and that kind of stuff. The Galvor Bach are really the ones that interest me the most. I mean, the unit is con- is it has a special rule applied to it called Damned. And basically, this unit never counts as a scoring unit, regardless of provisions of the mission being played. But in essence, these are an elite unit that are half demon, and um, they're, so they're like possessed. Yeah, they have their special. Yeah, they are possessed. I mean, they the they invite a demon to basically occupy their body with mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. So special rules: they have demon, they have stubborn, bulky, rage, rending. And a deep strike, and then they have this damned rule applied mm-hmm. to them. Basically, they can't be scoring. But in essence, they're the precursor to possessed mm-hmm. uh, Chaos Space Marines. Yeah. Having read a lot about word bearers recently, I'm really, I think they're just a really cool unit and like fluff wise, and I don't want to say role playing wise, but like thematically, yeah. I'm like totally, I'm on board with You them. like the evil space cleric? Totally. Thing. <laughs> yeah, I totally love it. And speaking of the evil space cleric, you have. Uh, High Chaplain Erebus, Mm -hmm. who, if there's a cleric, here's the guy. (laughs) And he comes in at 195 points. He Mm -hmm. is uh, marked by the Dark Fates, meaning that uh, in campaign games where character casualties are involved, which we talked about earlier, uh, and injury is a factor, uh, he gets to reroll on the chart if he gets injured. Mm. And he's the Harbinger of Chaos. So if he's your army's warlord, then its units may benefit from the Dark Channeling ability, which comes... uh, Previously, I, I actually didn't cover that. Sorry. Uh, the dark channeling ability means that a unit with dark channeling special rule has this terrible power of the warp bound into them. You roll on a d6 with them uh, at the beginning of the game, and you get to determine what each of these units do if the unit has dark channeling associated with it. On a one to three, they gain the zealot special rule. On a four to five, they get plus one strength for the duration of the battle. And on a six, they gain the demon special rule, which is huge because mm-hmm. then you're, you're, you the you're getting the invuln. All kinds of stuff. Uh, so, and, and then obviously with him in it, you can take a contingent from the chaos demon, demon list. And Kor Farron, who's the first captain, who's actually not a space marine, but an older human that's kind of encapsulated in Terminator armor. I didn't realize that. Yeah. He was, uh, he was actually Lorgar's like father on the planet where right. Lorgar arrived, and he was too old to be turned into a space marine. Is he toughness three or something? Uh, no, he he is toughness three. I take that back. Yeah, he is toughness three, uh, but he's in Terminator armor. He has a two plus, I think two plus five plus at this point. You know, he's just an interesting character. The models that they've come out for them are absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And then you have Lorgar, who's, when we're talking about points-wise, he's 375 points. I mean, he's, he's a lover, not a fighter. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that's a... That's what's his name from the Emperor's Children. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, weapon skill six. He's pretty much sixes across the board. Five five wounds. The armor of the word is what he has, and uh, basically his customized battle plate uh, is artificer armor. So he has a two plus four plus forged in the depths of a dying star. <laughs> Not quite, but he does have an invulnerable save that increases to three plus against any psychic empowered attack. So any kind of psychic attack against him, he's much better at resisting. He has a scepter maul that was fashioned for Lorgar by uh, Ferris Manus. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a plus two strength melee master crafted concussive smashing AP2 attack. And there's a really cool rule associated with him called Lorgar Transfigured. And basically what it says is this, when Lorgar came to embrace what he saw as the primordial truth of chaos... He used it and its sorceress lore to finally unlock his full psychic potential. And to represent this option, you may choose to use this special rule. If you do so, the Lorgar Transfigured special rule replaces the erratic psychic power rule. 
Lorgar Transfigured is a level three psyker who may select rather than randomly roll three powers in any combination from the telepathy or telekinesis disciplines at the start of the game. And when manifesting a psychic power, he rolls 3d6 and picks the two lowest on hmm. his roll. Does that cost more points? 75 more points. So he okay. becomes a 450 point. So then he gets to point. be a badass yeah. when you take that option. Yeah. He's a badass. That's the only right. option to right. take, yeah. quite frankly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, it, and the model, too, by the way. Yeah. Well, the model I like. Like uh, I've heard a lot of complaints about the face of the model. Really? I think it's awesome. Hmm. What do you think? No, I thought it was awesome. What are people complaining about? They think he looks too old and despondent. I think he looks saddened and awesome. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think he's very, very cool. He has a couple other rules that go with him. But in essence, I mean, that's, that's Lorgar. But I, I have to say, I really like I like his pose. I love his mm-hmm. armor. His yeah. armor is absolutely gorgeous. I think it's a I think it's a beautiful model. So I think maybe the skin just needs like a brighter paint job. The the like lines around his mouth and stuff mm-hmm. seem to make him look a bit older. But okay. I don't know. Maybe maybe on a brighter paint job, it it would it would help. So um, why don't we do this? Let's let's take a break. We're okay. gonna come back. We'll give our final bang for your buck on this wonderful book. You want to talk about the Titan Legion and the Mechanicus stuff? We'll talk about that briefly since it's 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 short. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll give our bang for your buck. Final notes. We'll close out the show. Sounds point. good. All right. Be right back. Tired of showing up for games with unpainted models? Got a big tournament coming up and need some models painted? Smells Like Wargaming has your answer. With our affordable rates and quick turnaround time, Smells Like Wargaming can get your models on the tabletop and ready for action. Check us out at smellslikewargaming.blogspot.com and see our previous projects. Remember, it's not your gamer buddies. It smells like wargaming. Hi, this is the Big Cat from Life After the Cover Save, and you're listening to the Independent Characters, part of the West Coast Podcast Alliance. Okay, so we're back, and Jeff, uh, you had a chance to take a look at the Legio Atreus? Ataris. Ataris. Yeah, that one, and also the Cybernetica stuff. So I wanted to touch on that really quickly because the Mechanicum, Mechanicus, whatever, section of 30K is what's kind of drawing me in. So yeah. I'm interested in Salamanders in 30K. I have some Forge World, Older Mark armor, some other pieces. So I, I think that will be part of it. Uh-huh. But really, I think if I started, say, a Zone Mortalis 30K Force, it's going to be the Mechanicum. So okay. that that's what's kind of drawn my interest. So do you want to talk about that one first, or do you want to talk about the Titan stuff? Let's first? talk about the Titans first, okay. then. So th- we have a a small Titan Legion. And so they grade it as a uh, Secundus grade Titan Legion. Okay. So not one of the bigger ones. That is helping out on the side of... The good guys, okay. <laughs> you know the uh, the loyalists. This is a Titan Legion, uh, a Taurus, whose symbol, I guess their their heraldry is a, a flaming sword. Yeah, who are mistrusted by those that within the Mechanicum. Also, they don't get along. They just don't play well with others. I guess. Okay. It, it, there's a really neat little story here about how they came about, and it, it involves some <laughs> kind of shady dealing. Where yeah, we're totally gonna help you guys out. We're going to give you, you know, we mean no harm. So we're going to give you a third of what we've got. Just when the Mechanicus forces show up to get that, they send it all out into Explorator fleets. Mm-hmm. Like they time okay. it so that as they're arriving, all of their surplus supply just goes. Yeah, yeah. It just leaves right then and there. Oh, we don't have it on hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just left. You just missed it. Yeah, so <laughs> so they go off and set up these other Forge Worlds and rediscover Forge Worlds and things like that. It just kind of... They just basically they just dick move it up. It's about, so. it's about two pages of fluff. It's not a lot around it. Not not a whole lot. Not yeah. too in depth. But at least it gives you some insight into it. Mm-hmm. Geez, I'd say it's maybe even just one page of real fluff in there. Yeah, kind of because the first page yeah. is mostly taken up by their their or, little or, symbol there. Okay, and then it talks about some of their their titans. And so we started looking up these names for titans that we weren't familiar with. Things like. The Night Gaunt, the Carnivore, the Nemesis, that kind of stuff. Right. It turns out most of it is just variants of already existing Titans, but it really got me thinking, what if they came out with a new class of Titan, mm-hmm. right? I mean, something in between a, a Warhound and a Reaver. Okay. So, you know, I don't know. It, it, that excites me. I assume there's possibility for that. I mean, as we looked into these, we saw that most of them were 
maybe mentioned in one line back in the Legion Titanicus right. game, or you know, I mean, th- there's very rare. I, I, I guess that's the thing Alan's good at, right? right. Is going back and finding like these rare references to unique uh, models or, or unique units that have maybe only been mentioned once, mm-hmm. and then pulling them forward into this, which is kind of cool because it kind of refreshes them. It gives them the opportunity to potentially do something new again. I don't know the last time that... Well, I guess the last time that Forge World came out with a Titan was that Eldar Titan, the giant one. Yeah, I think you're right. And mm-hmm. that was two years ago. Yeah, three. In April. Three years ago? Was yeah, that the first Adepticon I think it was we the first to? Adepticon we went to. Wow, that's yeah. it's been some time. So I can't believe that... It's a big model, I mean... Yeah. Well, where are the, where are the Imperial Knight Titans? Where are those guys? Yeah. They're like smaller than a Warhound? I don't know, maybe... Maybe Prime said, no, you don't get to do that because we're doing that as our, like, big model for for IG or something like that. Maybe. Like, like IG needs more big models. But anyway, there's not, like, a whole lot to that. I mean, it's a Titan Legion, right? So there's that kind of stuff going on. The Legio Cybernetica stuff is... So before you get started on that, because you and I talked about this a little bit before, before you started, and you were... This is something you're very excited about and something you've been talking about doing for a long time. But okay. your feeling on this across the Heresy book so far is that it's still kind of feeling itself out. It's still kind yes. of taking shape, mm-hmm. and maybe they haven't spick- picked a, a, a specific direction yet, but they're adding a few units here or there. Uh, can you go into depth a little bit about that? Yeah, so between the first book, which has a lot more... I don't. I guess maybe not even a lot more. It just has several units in it, some of which are also in this book. There's a special character in the other book. There's not one in here. Right. It it just feels like the Mechanicum part of it is not fully realized yet. There you go. On the part of Forge World. Battery's dying on that laptop. Sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> and so they're kind of they're kind of piecemealing it to us. And on the one hand, I can see that that Mechanicum list from the first book being complete for that book. Sure but not in terms of being a, a complete army in right, any way. Right. And then you come over to this one, which has a lot of overlap with that one. Right. And this one even goes back and says, all right, well, you can use this guy with that other list, too, right. from book one. At some point, they're going to have to consolidate everything, especially if they're going to piecemeal it out across all these books. Right. They're going to have to consolidate it maybe into one Mechanicum tome or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if I see them doing that, but I do see them continuing to update the list mm-hmm. until it takes maybe a major part. Like if they do a Horus Heresy book involving the fight on Mars. That would be so freaking awesome. I mean, I mean how awesome is that going to be? I think, I think they'll, they'll get to it. Incredibly awesome. Honestly. I hope so. I hope so, but <laughs> but we're we're not even close to that yet. Is the thing? It, All right, it just, I'll back it's, off. <laughs> it's it's we have so far because I started pricing out how much this is going to cost me to buy, and right now there are really, in terms of the army itself, there's really three models. Yeah, there's the HQ guy, which is a big snail thing. Yeah, you've got a robot and then a big robot. All right, and that's that's the extent of your army list. I mean, we don't have like. The Skitari and the things yeah. like the really core things that we you need to kind of play this as a fully realized, fully fleshed out army. Now, yes, I can hear you saying, yeah, you can you can scratch build these things. You know, we already have access to servitors, so that is part of what goes in here. All the HQ and independent character type guys get their little, you know, four to five servitors. Yeah, and you gotcha. can take three more for blah blah blah. You know, okay, that's all there, but. But it just doesn't feel whole. It doesn't feel complete. Yeah, I don't think it's there yet. But it is really interesting. I, the The rules are very interesting. Um, again, tons and tons of options. I yeah. can possibly go through all of them. But the great thing is that they don't feel like Marines. They don't feel like Imperial Guard. Mm-hmm. They don't feel like any army that currently exists in this book, any other 30K or any 40k. I think that's important too. I mean, often I see, clutch. you know, topics come up that say what race would you like to see next or what alien race, you know, should we add to the game? And my argument about it back is, well, what how is this race going to perform differently right. than right. than another race? I mean, I think that's the the fundamental underlying thing. I love the fluff of things like I'd love to see like some kind of lizard man race. I've always been a big fan of like mm-hmm. lizard man dudes. But how would they function differently than everything else? I don't know that there's room for that Mm -hmm. at the moment. 
certainly people more creative than I could probably come up with something. And obviously, you, Alan has here with this mechanical force. And you definitely have to keep it from just becoming Necrons. I mean, we've already oh, yeah. got our mechanical warriors, right? So Absolutely. It, it, there is a fine line there. And I, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm complaining that it's not all here yet. I just want to point that out to people who are wondering. It's a, it's a fair observation. Yeah. I would rather they take the time and and play with it a little bit and figure out that niche for it to fall into. Sure. Before we end up with more models that just feel like playing with the same rules as before, right? Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, so far, I think everything's going well. They're doing a great job. I the mean, the models even, are gorgeous. Models yeah. are amazing. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's even like a little pseudo psychic power mm-hmm. section for these guys uh, called uh, Cyber Theurgy. Okay. Where they're using it, it kind of sounds like um, hocus pocus. Is what it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, they use their. It, it's like the um, using the machine code kind of magically sure. that sort of thing sure. to influence different uh, like, units on the battlefield. Almost like hacking. In a yeah, way. yeah. I, I like it because it works a little bit differently than the psychic powers do. It works differently than the uh, what are the new? The, it's like the war chant blessing things from the sisters and the oh the yeah, inquisition yeah, yeah, one yeah. whatever it is the war rights or whatever yeah it, it's different than that and and i like the way that it works and there's things that can go wrong where the machine refuses to do it and he turns on you and you lose the victory <laughs> points as though he'd been destroyed and now your opponent gets to control him for the rest of the game that kind of stuff very That's pretty cool it, it fits with what's going on and makes it different than psychic powers so cool very excited about that Definitely pulling the trigger on this. I think I'm going to order the stuff and have it been waiting saying. for me at Adepticon. So, all right, that's a big step. Well, it's not going to be that big initially, but, <laughs> but it is going to. I mean, it's going to cost a, a bit of money even yeah. to just get started. So, okay. So I'm looking forward to that, um, and and excited to see more of this. Oh yeah, if they came out with that Mars book, man, that'd be great. So bang for your buck. Yeah, we move into that. So. Horse Heresy 1, we gave a Strength 9 AP3 rating. That's a pretty strong rating. It's a pretty strong rating. It's a pretty strong book. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're a campaign fluff player, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, let's uh, qualify that a little bit. Yep. Uh, Jeff, what are you thinking here in terms of strength? I have to to relate it back to the first book. I I don't think there's a way to do it that's fair without that. And, And the thing is, you have to have that first book to play 30k yep i mean how do you how do you rate volume two of an encyclopedia set right <laughs> that's you know <laughs> right well without volume one <laughs> volume two is lacking a few things it, i mean yeah if you want to relate it back to like the bad up war stuff yeah. so i think with this one we saw we saw more of the same mm-hmm. we have different legions covered we don't have the generic space marine legion list that mm-hmm. we had in the first mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. right and, and do you really want it? I mean, who's buying volume two of this without volume one? True. It, well, you shouldn't. That's for sure because you can't. You don't have a list. Right. But, right. But it, it's it's more of a, it's a continuation item, yeah. right? I think, and yep. a continuation, as you said, if you're playing thirty k, you're you're in anyway, right? I mean, you're you're all in. So overall, I would say that the campaign system in this one felt a little. I I use the the phrase stripped down. Okay. Not that it's missing things, but that it's maybe streamlined, if that makes sense. Yep. So it's it's missing some of the aspects that we saw before, um, such as you win a phase and then you get certain rules that apply to the next phase Correct. that you fight. Um, it uses... They're right? almost inherently built in, in a way. I mean, in the way the missions stack up. They are, and the, you know? the way that you yeah generate missions and things like that. It. But it isn't... I mean, it's not the same, right? It's no. not a tangible... Okay, we're fighting this round so that no, we yeah, can... yeah. But what I'm saying is like the effects. Yeah, yeah. one does yeah. not change the other, but the effects on each force from round to round right. Right. are are there. But you have no say in in how that happens based on the outcome of the previous round. Right. So with that stuff being said, I'm gonna have to give it a lower strength. Okay, I think that's fair. I'm very happy to see my legion represented here. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm happy sure. with that. I'm happy with the additions. I hope maybe in the next book, which we're predicting is going to cover things like the Raven Guard, mm-hmm. Alpha Legion, the Iron Warriors, and whoever else was there that I'm not thinking of <laughs> will be in the next one. And maybe they'll add in the way that they added 
to the legions that were in Betrayal Mm -hmm. in this book. Maybe Mm -hmm. they'll add to the legions that are in this book in the next one. Yeah. Cleanup. Aftermath. I don't know what it'll be called. I I think it has to do with, like, you know, rear actions that are going on as these forces are broken up and and fleeing and... Okay. You know, I, I I believe that's what it has to do. I'd have to go back and look. I know it's been released. You guys can use Aftermath if you want. Sure, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can take that. First one's free. I think it's already titled. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it probably is. But anyway, so I, I hope that they go back and, and retro some of that stuff. So I I would say for this one, I think I'm going to give it a seven. Ooh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So only in terms of relating it back to... The book before it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to go strength eight. Okay. And the reason is I think the production quality has gone up, which I didn't think was possible, but with the addition of the sketches and that kind of thing, it's gone up a little Mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. I think the implementation of rules from legion to legion are very different and very unique, Mm -hmm. and I like the direction they're going. I mean, now we have eight legions covered. Yep. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So... And can all I, of those seem to play very differently. Can I do seven and a half? Sure, if you want. <laughs> if you want. Strength seven and a half. Forge World's not going to complain yeah, okay. if it goes up. <laughs> no, I, 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 it's a struggle between seven and I, eight I for hear me. you. I hear you. So I'm going to go with an eight on okay. this for me um, in terms of, of strength of the book. I agree with all those points that you made. So. Okay. And then value. You know, mm-hmm. bang, you know, the value of this being the AP. Uh, the previous one we gave an AP three to. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we think you well, we said you were getting what you paid for right. in this. To to me, and I'll throw mine out there first. I think you're continuing to get what you pay for. Like you said, though, uh, you do need the previous mm-hmm. book uh, to really realize this. So I'm gonna. But if you're going Horus Heresy, you're all in at this yeah. point. Yep. What I fear for are the people who come to this party late mm-hmm. and are like, you know, I'd really like to do a Heresy army. They're like, great. Buy these ten, yeah. no, these ten hardback, hundred and twenty dollar, right. hundred twenty five dollar books. Right. You know, the, the entry level. If you try to get into this late, is going to be dramatic. So, did I tell <sighs> you I saw one of these books at Half Price Books? No Used. way. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Did you pick what? what? Yeah. Why didn't you pick it up? Well, it wasn't half price. I can tell you that. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it was up on the like collector's item. Oh, shop. that's it was a hundred bucks. I thought you were saying it was half price. No, no. All right. So yeah, I'm, but I, again, I think we are still seeing the value that you want in this. The four legions covered are mm-hmm. really the highlight of the book for me. That and the campaign system really are. I'm I'm going to continue to go with yeah. AP three here. It, so it is the same campaign system system as before. Yes. Different the story itself, told itself, it. right? The rules in the story are different. And the missions are different. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to give it a four. I, I think I have to drop it down a little bit just because of some of the, the omissions. I mean, for the if, if for whatever reason I had to choose between buying this one and mm-hmm. buying the other one for my 120 whatever dollars, mm-hmm. I think you have to go with the other one, right? I mean, you, you're just going to get more out of it. Now, granted, the Legion that I want is in this one, right? Right. So there's probably three more books after this one that I could skip, right? Gotcha. You need the first one, and if they come out with another Space Marine Legion list down the road, maybe you just need that one plus whatever book covers your Legion. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I totally see what you're saying. The foundation is in in book one. Yeah. The foundation of everything you're going to build on is in book one. Now, the disposition of forces may Mm -hmm. have them change the way that list works later on in the heresy and if that happens then maybe that's the book to buy you you may start the game experience you want you may start to see mixing of units as they're you know the allies are trying to Mm -hmm. you know loyalists are trying to recover Mm -hmm. or whatever but just think back all the like battlefield conditions and things like that that we got there's no zone mortalis in this book at all no (laughs) that's all right that knocks it down a point for you (laughs) specifically all right. Well, cool. I think that's I think that's a very very fair you know reading of it. Uh, so yeah, I'm going strength eight AP three. You're going strength seven, seven point five <laughs> AP four. Yep. Um, so there you go. I mean that's that's really it. The book is beautiful. It is. It, if you're into this kind of thing or you're into the Horus Heresy, this is the book to have. And uh, yeah, not enough can be said about that. So Jeff, let's just kind of close out the show. It should be noted this is your last episode as it second chair, actually, as yep. co-host as co- yep. of the independent characters. Yep. And the end uh, of an era. Three, three and a half, almost four years of doing this. 
uh, when we first started off. I was actually listening when you came over today. I was actually listening to an old episode that oh, we really? did. Yeah, painful. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> to. that old, huh? <laughs> I, oh boy, we've come a long way. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, you and I can sit down in front of the mics now, and we're fairly practiced at this, and we have a flow that works for us, and yeah. and the way we work, and and that's going to be uh, hard to replace. And and I don't know that it is replaceable uh, in the long term. You know, I just want to say that uh, I'm going to continue to do my best, and you'll be here from time to time, yeah. so that's not a big deal. But I'll let you know when you get it wrong. I'm sure <laughs> you will. You'll yell at your at your uh, at your stereo speakers as you're playing your MP3s through them. But. I'll make sure I turn on Siri first so that you get the message <laughs> at the same yeah. time. But we've got uh, we've got a good lineup, I think, of people that are going to help me out to to continue in the the great vein that you and I started. And uh, I just got to say thanks, because this is bigger than I think we ever expected it to be. By far, yeah. I, I, I think when we start out, like, I never anticipate, well, are we going to be doing this three years from now? We were thinking, like, are we going to do this five episodes from now? Yeah, yeah. And now, you know, it's, it's, we're coming up, this is 91, and we're coming up into getting close to the triple digit number for, I got to say, uh, Every other week, pretty much, we've we've produced the episode, and yeah. what I think is high quality, regardless of what I just said about our earlier episode. <laughs> and the sound ta- quality was there, <laughs> but it takes a lot of research and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And, and I just want to thank you very much for your time and, and for doing this with with me. It's been an absolute blast, and I, I know you know I'm not saying goodbye to you. You no. know, you're, we see each other, we'll see each other all the time, but uh, maybe we'll be able to get more games in yeah. together now. <laughs> Certainly, be easier to talk Lisa into giving me the pass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, and so you know, we'll see you again soon. But but thank you so much. And, yeah. And uh, if you want to send thanks to Jeff, is Jeff at the Independent Characters dot com email address. There's no A in independent, by the way. I just no. want to tell people that I've right. had a number of people say they tried to email it bounce. I said, did you put an A in independent? Oh yeah. <laughs> There's no A in independent. Jeff at independentcharacters.com is still going to be active the until you say... TheIndependentCharacters.com. Yeah. All right. Jeff at TheIndependentCharacters.com. Yes, it's a long domain name. will be active until you don't want it active anymore. So you let me it know does. when that is. Yeah. And uh, until then, I don't have anything else to add. Do you I have do. anything yeah, you want to add? Of course. I figured course I you did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also want to thank you for helping me out through this whole thing. I mean, obviously, you've done a lot of the work that's gone into this and... Uh, I think together we have built something certainly to be proud of and, and something that both of us are proud mm-hmm. of. And it's, it's one of the, the bigger accomplishments in my life at this point. Um, so it, again, it's very, very difficult to step away from this, but uh, the, the time had come to do that. Uh, I do want to thank everyone who listens to the show and has mm-hmm. enjoyed the show, whether this is your first episode or you, Go way back to those. And if it is, you really should have listened to ninety. Before yeah, you should have. <laughs> should have, and probably sixty four too. Yeah. Um, but it, going all the way back to those painful episodes to to listen mm-hmm. to now. Um, thank everyone for the for the support, uh, and then not only that, but just thank I guess the the show itself. Yeah. As yeah. a as a vehicle and giving me the opportunity and I guess the excuse the reason to go out and meet. So many awesome people, whether they listen to the show or we just met them gaming or, or what have you. Made a lot of friends through the show. That's what I mean. A just lot. A ton of friends and, yeah. and people that I never expected to, to meet. I never expected to be carrying on you know, Facebook conversations internationally with people and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, never worried about uh, time zones so much in my entire <laughs> life as I have since, <laughs> since doing this show. So... Uh, it's been really wonderful. I'm really looking forward to to coming back and kind of guesting and, and helping out where I can. It'll be fun to see how far your hobby progress has gone it's since then. Embarrassing. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that I always have some hobby progress. <laughs> if it, if it's, even if it's just putting uh, technical paint on a base, <laughs> I'm going to do it. All right, man. Well, until next time, this is Carl. And this is the last time you'll hear Jeff. Until next time. (laughs) Until next time, you're Jeff. And if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the boiler room.
This episode of The Independent Characters is protected by the Creative Commons license. If you have further questions as to its use, you can find information on the front page at theindependentcharacters.com. Thank you.